Yay, live. we're live. And we're live. <laughs> After much toil, we're finally live on the wrong channel in the YouTube reverse. Whatever. All right, I'm going to play this intro and then we can get moving. News, ops, and a little bit of paranoia. Welcome to the Iron Sysadmin Podcast. Welcome, everyone, to tonight's episode of the Iron Sysadmin Podcast, which, after a very rocky start, uh, we're finally live. I'm your host, Nate. I have my usual, one of my usual co-hosts with me, Jason, and our special guest tonight, tonight, Georgia Weidman. Hi. Hey, hi, Georgia. <laughs> <laughs> so... I think we'll just head right into an interview first, and then uh, we'll handle the news later. So, uh, Georgia, you want to tell the people a little bit about you in case they don't already know? <laughs> okay. Well, I am Georgia, and let's see. I have a couple of companies. I have Bulb Security LLC, which is my like consulting company where we do pin testing and training, and that's where all my book money goes and things like that. So we do, you know, some research as well for clients. Um, so that's kind of my catch-all. And then I also have a company called Shavira, which when you're starting a company, you should definitely come up with a name that no one can either say or spell. That is great branding right there. So there's your, you know, little bit of business advice from probably the worst business person ever. So take it as you will. But at Shavira, we do um, actually mobile security testing products. So all the consulting is on one company and all the products are on the other. Um, so you might, Possibly, if you've heard of me, uh, remember my smartphone pen test framework that I did through DARPA Cyber Fast Track a while back as a research project. So at Shavira, we've actually productized that. So, you know, APIs and front ends and automation and integration with SIMs and all those things that you don't have to do for like a security tool, but you do for a product. So we do, you know, everything from mobile phishing over, you know, text message or WhatsApp or any other way you might think about being fish like near field communication or Bluetooth, you know, sky is the limit rogue cell towers. We do that. Um, we also do penetration testing. So, you know, any of the vulnerabilities that are out there, you know, testing those as well as um, the post exploitation side, you know, we've got a, a lot of, you know, security products that are out there for mobile and it's like, okay, I'm a user and, or corporate user and I'm like so what do I need to buy does this actually provide me like the stuff it says on the back of the box so we can help you with that like uh, yeah so cool. kind of like do the testing um, let's see I'm also um, an author I wrote penetration testing a hands-on introduction to hacking currently working on the second edition and that should hopefully be out very soon um and let's see i'm also a trainer so i've done like training at places like black hat and uh you know places like you know i did a class at nsa once so i do private corporate trainings as well as at conferences and i'm also an instructor i guess it's called an adjunct professor at uh tulane and university of maryland uh university college so like one of the university of maryland colleges um let's see what else do i do i do do security research so from time to time you can find me on stages at conferences uh, i'm keynoting carbon black connect in a couple weeks in san diego um let's see what else do i do i'm also a uh what is it called Cybersecurity policy fellow at new america um so my primary focus there is internet of things but you know they're really cool i do a lot of a good projects over there um so that's all i can think of right now but <laughs> well it was quite the list <laughs> sorry um, did you want me to talk for like 30 seconds and then no 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 that's like, that is that is perfectly fine i i remember seeing uh i think i've been in two or maybe three of your talks in person at conferences uh all about mobile security and each one of them made me want to put my phone into a faraday cage to put it back in my pocket uh, so yeah, some pretty interesting stuff you were doing back then. I haven't seen one of your talks in quite a while, but uh, I'm glad to see that it's it's blossomed into so much more. Um, I do remember an early talk you did on on your uh, mobile penetration testing kit, 
And that sounded pretty cool then and sounds like it's grown quite a bit since then. So cool. Good work. Thank you. So, uh, Jason, I think you have more uh, more questions lined up for Georgia than I do. Now that the intro is out of the way, do you want to go ahead and go down whatever path you had in mind? Yeah, I mean, um, you know, I we kind of want to talk about the company a little bit. Um, I know you've got you've got Bulb and you've got Shavira. Um, uh, I know you went through Mach thirty seven, and at least one of those was sort of a DARPA grant type setup. I mean, do you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, um, so I did the DARPA Cyber Fast Track back in 2012, and that was a really awesome program. I really wish they would bring it back, especially, you know, now that I'm a startup and it's like I need to be, like, getting government grant kind of stuff. You know, you, I think we didn't realize a lot of this. I'm sure some people did, like, how great the DARPA program was because, you know, the, the uh, application was really not that hard, and, you know, they turned it around really fast. Whereas, you know, if you're getting like an SBIR grant, which I couldn't even tell you what that stands for, small business something research probably, um, the kind of grants that people are looking for in the government, you basically have to have somebody on staff who's like an expert at writing those. And it takes like forever to get them. You know, a company can live and die waiting for government stuff. Certainly it's awesome when you get it, you can get a lot of really good money there, but you can live and die like waiting for it to happen. Um, so yeah, DARPA Cyber Fast Track was great because it kind of like bypassed that. So, you know, thank you to Mudge for that. That was really great. It, you know, it wasn't just me. You look at, you know, a lot of people who are doing really great things in security now and they went through that program. Um, so that was, you know, just a research project. So I was doing, you know, stuff for the community. So I released it open source as the smartphone pen test framework. You know, the original version of we're going to test phones the same way we do like computers and routers and things we're you know we're actually gonna do the same kind of testing instead of just like being like okay this is a a mobile security product now it'll solve all your problems all as well you know actually have the the testing side of it and so yeah i guess it was 2015 i went to an accelerator called mach 37 in the dc area and you know a lot of people that i knew from the community had done it um like J.P. Bourget did it. Uh, Marcus Carey did it. Um, you know, a few other people that I'm probably forgetting. Uh, G. Mark Hardy did it. Um, Joe Klein did it. You know, a lot of people who are well respected in our community had gone through it and said that, you know, maybe I should do it. And I was like, well, you know, I have this like small business and I suck at business. So this, this sounds like a great way for me to learn more about business as well as, you know, learn how to, I guess, bridge that gap from Here's my security tool to like, how do I get it one in the kind of shape that companies would buy it to, you know, use either in their pin testing practice or, you know, on site security teams using it to assess their security, things like that, as well as, you know, finding out, you know, how do you get like in the room for that sort of thing? Because through my consulting, pretty much people had almost always been inbound. They've been coming to me or it had been some contracting so people I knew you know needed more people or sent stuff to me um so being able to like change that into you know me being able to one get the meetings with like you know the security team of fortune you know 100 companies and you know getting them to say yes you know being able to I guess jump through the hoops necessary for that so you know I learned a lot at Mach 37 it was like kind of like a crash course and everything uh, business side in like three months. And I met a lot of really great people. You know, I knew a lot of people in the security community, but now, especially here in the DC area, because I actually have moved back full time to the DC area. And uh, I, I just met a lot of people in the like startup community, people who had, you know, more experience on that side, maybe not as much in, in cybersecurity per se. So, you know, it allowed me to, I guess, you know, meet people who could help me in other ways. And, yeah, it's been really good. Um, so yeah, I started Shavira, like kind of like spun out smartphone pen test framework into a separate company, um, Shavira. So yeah, things have been really good. You know, we've uh, gotten some really good customers. We've gotten, um, you know, the products moved forward really well. We we got some uh, startup funding as well, you know, from individual angels as well as some uh you know some like angel funds kind of things so like smaller vc firms that do you know the early stage investing so yeah it's i've learned a lot from the experience i mean i'm certainly like ready to i think 
you know, at some point have it acquired and, and go inside of a bigger company that has, you know, more salespeople, more developers and whatnot than I have. But I definitely would still want to be involved in it. So they'd be buying me as well as the products. So, but yeah, it's been a really interesting. Um, I've really learned so from a lot a- of it. From a startup perspective, is that sort of uh, a goal to sort of get a thing up and running and then get it sold to a larger company? And it, I'm not asking this as a judgment or anything toward what you're doing. I'm just curious from a business perspective. Well, like, is, is that a normal gonna... thing or is that like, a, no, yeah. I want this to be my own thing? And well, and my it really baby. depends. Um, I mean, some people really do want to you know, take it all the way which, you know, I guess the right way to look at it is run it as though you're going to take it all away yourself. But, you know, if you, you know, I mean, I have to take into account that, yeah, I've learned a lot about business, but, you know, I'm never going to be as good at business as I am at, say, security research. So, um, I mean, ultimately, I think, you know, I'm happier and I'm more effective when I'm spending more of my time on, like doing the research and finding the new ways to, you know, get into things and adding them to the products and say doing a bunch of sales calls and changing the colors on the user interface. So, yeah. I mean, really it's just, uh, you know, the right place for me. And I think, you know, the right place for the product would be in a place with more, you know, structure or infrastructure really than you know, I'm able to give it. I mean, some people want to go all the way to IPO and still be like CEO of their own company. Usually, especially with technical founders, it actually doesn't get that far. Your board will vote you out long before that, you know, because, you know, evangelist and founder kind of person. Um, but, you know, you can either, you know, try and take it all the way to IPO yourself and do, you know, multiple funding rounds and things like that, or, you know, get it to a point and then, you know, start looking for, you know, acquisitions for it, good places where it would be a good fit you know, to come together with, you know, other products. Like, I mean, for me, you know, it's, you know, we're, we kind of have a few areas we could fit in well, you know, phishing products that are just doing email for like security awareness training, being able to throw all our mobile stuff in so they can address additional things. And, you know, we get that structure, certainly anything that does penetration testing, um, you know, your, your meta exploits or anything like that. Um, you know, anybody who's doing red teaming or, uh, or any of those products, um, we would be obviously a good fit there as well as, you know, anybody who's doing mobile security preventative projects, you know, any of your mobile threat defenses or anything like that, you know, having this sort of more like, you know, active attack to like prove that it stops it kind of thing, you know, that would be a good augmentation. So, you know, you either, yeah, like I said, keep it forever until, you know, IPO and then you all get rich and, you know, you go on forever, but. Yeah, I guess I, yeah. I just I, I I know so little about the business aspect of anything. I mean, I've never run a, a large business. I've never even get anything to the point where I thought it would be, you know, viable. Other than a couple <laughs> hobbies, you know what I mean. So I was just yeah. kind of curious by that statement. That's all. Um, I know some people want to just keep things their own, and others, you know, their goal may be to make something attractive that they can sell off. Yeah, I mean, I I've heard that it's actually yeah. a pretty big problem for uh, entrepreneurs because. There's a lot of thrill involved in getting something off the ground and then they get bored, you know, once it's down to the minutia of managing a business. So I guess yeah. that makes a lot of sense. All right, cool. So what, what, uh, I mean, you, you took your, your mobile threat testing framework, framework, uh, and, and turned it into a company. Um, so, I mean, good on you. Um, <laughs> right. where, where, where is that? Where do you see that going moving forward? Like what, what I guess, um, what's the state of mobile today? I mean, where where do you see like the bigger issues, and and what do you sort of target with your your framework? Well, I think that we're actually in a very interesting place in mobility and IoT and cloud. You know, all those kind of like next geny things that kind of put in you know one box. Um, they kind of I think have a lot of the same problems. Um, you know, we very early on, kind of like, I guess you could say that, you know, if anybody had say an antivirus or anti this or an anti that, they basically, you know, would put the word mobile in front of it and then, you know, be able to make more money. Um, And I think, you know, that went on for a really long time. And certainly there, there have always been companies that have been, you know, doing preventative security well, be it in mobile or whatnot. A lot of the problem turns into that, you know, it isn't the, probably the biggest thing I've learned through this whole like business thing is that 
you don't necessarily get customers or do well just because your product is solving an important problem or if it's the best at it or anything. I mean, a lot of it comes down to, you know, sales and marketing and, and timing. Like, you know, I was always like that one who was like mobile, mobile, mobile. And everybody's like, shut up about mobile. It's not that big a deal. So, you know, being the first one or an early one into your market isn't necessarily a good thing. So I've had right. one, a lot of time to, you know, advance my products and make them mature because I've had a ton of time. Um, but that's also, you know, kind of slowed me down because clients were just, you know, at this point, you kind of have to like educate the market about why this is important, um, which, you know, to a security person, it's like, well, I do mobile security research and I do pen testing. When I do pen testing, nobody does anything around mobile. Obviously, the attackers do. So it just seems like a no brainer. But, you know, to your you know average person who might be buying this, maybe not so much. Um, but anyway, to actually answer your question. So I think now that we have like the category in Gartner of mobile threat defense, um, I think, you know, at least, you know, I've partnered with a lot of these companies um, and I'm actually seeing like them stopping a lot of attacks. I mean, everybody who puts on the back of their box, we stop zero days and 100% of attacks. They're bad. They're part of the problem. But um, I am starting to see products from the preventative side that are actually you know stopping a lot of attacks or at least putting up an alert for the user to you know make the decision or the admin to make the decision whereas you know if you'd asked me that like three to five years ago i would have said most of it was completely useless so we are finally seeing one that you know customers are waking up to the fact that just because it says on the back of the box that it stops the attacks that you know in the extreme you have applications that you install on your device that periodically wake up and they check whether they themselves are a virus because they're sandboxed so they can't see anybody else. Um, so that's, you know, an extreme of not doing anything useful. But, you know, now we've got things that, you know, are hooked into like, you know, the mobile device management APIs and becoming administrators. So they are able to see a lot more and, you know, they are really taking it seriously, looking at, you know, the kinds of attacks that people are really getting. So we are seeing definitely things moving forward in the preventative space. And, you know, that that's definitely helpful um, for my my product because I get, you know, customers who are like, well, we want to buy like the right stuff to solve this problem. Help us do it. And that I'm certainly able to do that. And you've also got, you know, the preventative products being like, I want to do a good job. I can partner with you and you'll like throw the real attacks and we'll be able to see whether we can catch it. And if not, we'll work together to make it so that we can. So just, I think that people are, are taking mobile security a lot more seriously, perhaps because we have seen it, you know, with like NSO group, for instance, who's, you know, out there throwing, you know, really scary iOS stuff at, you know, political dissidents, you know, depending on what country you're in, they're either like a human rights activist or a political dissident. So, you know, you take that how you will, but, you know, kind Funny of like how that, how that distinction yeah, works. Right. So we've been seeing, you know, they're actually showing up in the news. So I think people are kind of and then waking up to the fact that, you know, even I mean, especially with phishing, you know, we you know, you got Podesta and all of them with their emails. I mean, certainly, you know, if people are still clicking on links and, and emails, why wouldn't they click on a link in a text message or a direct message or Facebook message or WhatsApp message? You know, anyway, you can send a link is ways that you know, people can be targeted. So I think people are waking up to that. And I mean, that's just the biggest thing is the education of the market. And certainly, you know, one person with my mobile flag is, has not been enough to do that. But, you know, as the media is talking about it more as you know, the preventative pro project products have been, I guess, trying to differentiate themselves more, you know, it's getting talked about a lot more that there are and again, not just around mobile, but you know, I really think that IoT is in the same box and, and cloud as well. You know, it's things that particularly with bring your own device, like I think bring your own device and cloud are like almost identical in terms of the problem you have. It's like somebody else's stuff. They have to patch it out there in the cloud. You know, they might have missing Windows patches or default passwords and then all your stuff is just sitting there. Um, so I think it's really similar in terms of like we as the security team at a company don't have complete control over this thing. We don't really know as much about it as we would like to. And yet we still have to work with it. You can totally trust the cloud vendors. They have your back. Well, I got an email today from like G Suite that was like, uh, so because of like 
um, backwards compatibility. We may just have some of your like passwords um, in uh, plain text in our database. <laughs> so I was like, really? <laughs> <laughs> well, it was. I, I uh, believe the the technical term for that is oops. Yeah. yeah. Oops. <laughs> Face, Facebook got caught with that a couple. Well, like a month ago, wasn't it? Two months ago, yeah. maybe now. Yeah. Well, that's yeah. A long yeah. They were in the yeah. news. I, so I see those, I see those stories and I, I, you know, on the one hand, I'm like, well, you know, you guys should know better. Um, yeah. Your Google or your Facebook or your, you know, insert big company here. And on the other hand, I, you know, I have to think like it was, it was only available internally and, you know, they admitted it and like, is it really that bad? Like it's, it gets blown out of proportion a lot of times. So, well, I mean, anybody being able to see my password is bad. It's the, the, the scope of bad is what changes. If the world yeah, can but, see my password, that's a much worse bad <laughs> than if, yeah, if I mean, uh, some desk jockey you, at Facebook could get it. Right. But if you think about it, uh, somebody who works for the company, um, like you run a email server, do you need the password of any of your users to impersonate them? No, no. But until right. that person gets so, disgruntled and leaves and they walk out the door with right. a pile oh, no, of plain text no passwords. Yeah. Right. It's right. a lot harder to so, walk out the door with a dump of all, all think, the mailboxes. <laughs> I think the threat landscape there is 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 much smaller than the media makes it out to be. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, so I mean, uh, you're you're incredibly passionate about mobile. So what is it about mobile that that sort of gets you going? That that makes you so. I mean, every ever since I've sort of known about you, you've kind of been in the mobile space. Yep. So what is it about mobile that really gets you going? You know, I mean, it's, I often think that, you know, post Shavira, all this, like, do something completely different and just people will be like, what? We're just talking about something besides mobile. Oh my God. Um, but really, I mean, I kind of <laughs> fell into it. It was like, I did my first talk, you know, the first talk I ever submitted was to ShmooCon and it got in for, you know, whatever reason, it was kind of a naive thing to do to be like, oh, here's one of the like most prestigious cons in the world. I, as a first time speaker, who's never done security research before, I was turning this thing I was working on. You and, never know to try. Yeah. <laughs> and I got in and, uh, you know, that just so happened to be like a mobile thing that I was working on. And then it kind of became what I was known for. And I, you know, I kept working on it. I mean, this mobile was kind of the, the new frontier at the time. And uh, so, yeah, I've just really kind of focused on it. I don't know that. I mean, there was, I, there was no, I mean, I guess you could look at my career trajectory and think that it was really like well thought out, but it was more like, you know, random like darts being thrown at a board to see what would stick. Okay, that's, so, how, that's how I got I, into IT. I mean, these yeah. computer things were neat and then it turned into a career. I'm like, wait, how'd that happen? Yeah, yeah. I know exactly how you feel. I was, I was, uh, I was, I was attempting to go towards uh, game development and sort of fell mm -hmm. into networking and systems and, you know, security. And I sort of do all that stuff now. So. Um, so what, I mean, so what do you run on? What, what kind of a phone do you carry around with you? Like, what do you consider uh, to be that's a good question? She's like, I, I, I have a flip phone because I don't trust any of them. Oh, <laughs> uh, you know, I kind of am in the opposite direction. You know, people ask me all the time, like for security tips and like, you know, I can give people security tips, but they're always like, what do you do around security? And I'm like, almost nothing. I mean, certainly with my like customer data and things like that, obviously I I'm more careful, but in terms of like me in my everyday life, I probably break like all the security rules because, you know, if I really stopped to think about it and did like everything I knew I was supposed to do, I wouldn't do anything besides like change my passwords and connect to different things and you know, update things. And it's just like, you know, you can't live like that. And I've actually been pretty successful, but I know I'm like painting a target on my back right now. Like, come back <laughs> my stuff. But I mean, I, you know, I, you know, I'm not really had I, a problem. It's, it's not much different than most security people that I've talked to that. Yeah. That no, preach, you know, use antivirus and set up firewalls. And then you go and you ask them like, well, what are you doing? Like, well, I just sort of run vanilla this and I don't bother. I don't have time for yeah. any of that crap. Antivirus yeah, yeah, right right things down and yeah. yeah so, What's that yeah. old saying? The uh, the shoemaker's kids have no shoes. Uh, yes. Yeah. yeah hey, that that's a thing. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, I have all my like corporate like user data stuff like separate, and that's all like you know, not on anything that I'm like screwing with 
malware and Facebook and things on. But, you know, in my, like, day-to-day -day use stuff, I'm, I'm, like, really, you know, I see these people that are, like, you know, they'll, like, take their plane ticket and, like, rip it into all these pieces and put it in, like, different trash cans. And I'm like, dude, I just don't care that much if people know <laughs> about my life. I really yeah. don't. <laughs> Yeah, I used to be that way, and it's just it's too much trouble to. I've yeah, I've I've done that, that with uh, <laughs> like yeah. like if, if I if I shred a check or something, I'm I'm like wait, all the pieces are in the same can. If somebody got that yeah. can, they'd have the whole thing. <laughs> Like, yeah, I don't. You know, I haven't really had that many problems with it, and I, I imagine no, I that's probably random. <laughs> My dad does. Did My it. dad always gets his credit card hacks. I don't know what he's doing. But like he's always having to get a new credit card, and I'm like, I put my credit card into the most shady sites imaginable, and never have a problem. <laughs> well, Jason here has a good story about how his bank card got hacked before it ever even got to him. Oh yeah, well it happened again <laughs> last week. But uh, you're kidding. Yeah, I had I had, uh, I, had I had for you. I had uh, this was years ago. I had a card yeah. that got compromised somehow. I don't even remember what it was. Wait, I mean, you and I were still and working I, together because you were telling yeah. me about it on the commute home. Yep. And I, and I caught it and contacted the bank and I'm like, Hey, um, I don't know what this is, but it ain't me. And I, you know, went through the whole thing and they're like, okay, we'll market as fraud and we'll send you a new card. And, uh, must've been like three or four days later. I log into my bank account. I haven't gotten the new card yet. I log into the bank account. I'm like, um, call my wife. I'm like, Hey, did you spend like $400 at Walmart in, you know, Philly? She's <laughs> like, um, no. I'm like, okay. So I call the bank. I'm like, hey, um, I, you know, I'm not sure what's going on, but this this charge is is not us. And they, they sort of push back a little bit. They're like, well, wait, you know, like it's your card. I'm like, I haven't gotten the card yet. <laughs> yeah. They're like, what do you mean? I'm like, I just I put in for a new card last week. They're like, oh, we've got it. We'll take care of it. And it was it was in that voice of like, we know who did this. They're about to go to jail, and uh, nice. and, and yeah. you know the charge went away, and I got my new card, and everything was great. Um, you know, but it happens. I mean, I got my card got compromised last week. I have no clue how the hell it got compromised. Um, they, you know, just a charge in the middle of Jersey somewhere at, at a store that I, you know was uh, BJ's. I don't even have a, a a membership to BJ's, so I don't, you know. And uh, in New Jersey, no less. Ugh. Yeah, and they've they've gotten better because they called me. Injury. They called me and, uh, you know, they're like, Hey, uh, is this your, is this your charge? I'm like, I don't live there and no. And they're like, okay, so we canceled your card. You're going to have to go get a new one. And I went, Yay. Yay. now I get Yay. to change all my accounts again. Um, so, so, you know, security is fun, but it's yeah. some of it's getting better. I mean, the yeah. stuff's getting a little bit better. It's frustrating, but. Well, to answer the other part of your question, like what phone do I use? Actually, one of the biggest perks I have is that because one of the things I do is, uh, you know, do research for other companies and I get a lot of stuff on mobile. So they often buy me like multiples of like the latest phones. So and then I get to keep them afterwards. They never ask for them back. So, you know, the if you want to be my friend, it's a good way to get like extra phones that are lying around because they have like <laughs> eight See, and eight. And now we like know. That. Now we know why she got into mobile testing because she gets free phones. Free phones. Phones are expensive, man. <laughs> yeah, and then there and the people at the stores are always like, "Why do you want eight iPhones?" And I'm like, "Cause I'm cool like that." <laughs> so have you have you tested the Galaxy Fold yet? I have not. That has not oh, come okay. up yet. Um, no? no. Because they're afraid gonna... to give it to anybody yet. <laughs> <laughs> the last people they gave it to all found all the problems with it, and they yeah, weren't trying to penetration it. test it. <laughs> 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 they were just trying to use it. Yeah, that's generally how it goes. I mean, I tell people that the reason that I'm, I guess, kind of good at my job is because I'm actually terrible at using technology. <laughs> so I use it wrong and that finds the problems. It's like, you know, I mean, I, I hate to say that because, you know, I'm a girl and stuff and, you know, they already say, girls get a computer, but I'm like, I actually cannot computer. And that's why I am able to find all the problems because I use it wrong. <laughs> that's yeah, valid. I mean, you, you say girls can't computer, but then you turned around and, and, and wrote a book about pen testing that, um, you know, I've seen, I've seen, uh, at least probably half a dozen tweets 
about how they're using it as a college uh, textbook at this point. So, yeah. I mean, yeah. I, you know, I have a copy on my, my bookshelf. Um, you know, my son is, has, has already gone through it and, and sort of devoured it. Um, I mean, you know, kudos. It, it's, so, it is a really great book and you're working on, working on version two, I believe. I am. I am working on version two and version two is going to be more than twice as good as the original. And it's going to have, you know, technology has moved forward such that we can have, you know, better, I guess, tie-ins. So make it easier to do your labs. So you don't have to, you know, set everything up if you don't want to, you know, we've got some things and, you know, ability to like, continue for, you know, after you've done the book and kind of like grow organically with like tie-ins online and things. So yeah, cool. addition two is going to be awesome. But uh, yeah, the book stuff, it was like, I guess people thought I was security book and wanted is the book that I wished I had had when I was starting security. Um, you know, when I started, well, my, my mom has a PhD in computer science. So when I say girls can't computer, I say it with my tongue out. I just can't enunciate with my tongue out. So just imagine that my tongue just is imagine out. The, okay. Yeah. So, I mean, I obviously knew that girls could computer because, you know, I'd seen my mom and all my mom's friends were also like computer scientists who were female. So that never really worked on me. The girls can't computer, but you know, when I started in security, you know, I didn't really know that many people yet, if at all, you know, I knew a few but, you know, I tried to take the OS Defensive Security Certified Professional Test and, well, and the course before it. And, uh, you know, it was a really great course, but there was, like, a lot of knowledge that I didn't have yet. You know, I knew a little bit about Linux, and I knew a little bit about this, and I knew a little bit about, about that. You know, compared to the person on the street, you know, I was the person they called to fix the computer. But, like, I still felt like I didn't really have all the knowledge that was expected of me for that. And, you know, I would if you try and ask for help, they literally have something that writes back at you that says try harder, which now as a business person, I really get, I mean, one in the hacker community, this idea of like being super elite is, you know, a big thing. So, I mean, that works for, you know, their brand, but also they don't have to pay people for like help. So, you know, they're making more money that way. So I totally get it. But, you know, I just had, I didn't feel like I got as much out of, though I passed the test on my second try, I will admit it. I, so I think I did about the same on both. So I don't know if they just, you know, let you pass the second time. But, uh, you know, I, I didn't feel like I got as much out of the course part, like, because there were all the, like, lab machines. And there were some of them I just didn't get. And I feel like I, while I passed the test, I feel like I there were probably some, like, techniques and things that I didn't know that I probably should have. Like that I would have if I'd gotten all the lab machines. So, you know, I kind of really struggled in the beginning um, with that sort of thing. So, you know, I wanted to write the book that I wished I'd had when I was going through that course. So every time somebody writes me and they're like, your book is the only reason I passed OSCP. I mean, part of me is like, well, you know, I got, uh, you know, maybe $3, $8. I don't know. You'd have to add it up what actually I get in royalties and offensive security got like 1500 of your dollars. So obviously I'm not doing this business thing right here, <laughs> but it does fill me with a sense of pride that, you know, I, I did accomplish, you know, that goal that it has allowed people to have an easier way into InfoSec and certainly, you know, in the time since cause it's been out for four years, which makes me feel really old and is why I need to get the second edition out. But I mean, there's certainly, you know, a lot more beginner friendly stuff online now. And there's, you know, other courses and other like uh, things that are hosted in the cloud for like VMs for people to try. But I mean, certainly like, and especially like in other countries, like, it got translated into Portuguese. So when I like went to Brazil, you know, they don't get a lot of tech books in their, you know, native tongue. So I apparently have a lot of Brazilian fans, That's pretty which, cool. which was cool. Yeah. Cool. Um, it was really hot there though. I don't know if Iron Sissiman has any Brazilian fans. Who? <laughs> Us, we know we have, us, the we, podcast. Oh, oh have, sorry. Uh, I, I heard like Ian Asman, and I'm like, I don't nope, know who Iron, that is. Iron Sissiman. That's what I said. Okay, Iron Sissiman. We. We have UK fans. We know that. Yeah. Um, yeah, that we do. I'm not sure where that else. We do. So I mean, um, to your credit, I'd I'd have to say that's probably the best reason to write a book. You know, you 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 noticed something that was missing in the industry, something you wish you had, and you fixed that. 
And that's awesome. That's a great reason to write a book. In fact, that's that's part of why I thought to start this podcast, because there weren't a lot of ops-focused IT podcasts that I was able to find. There's a ton of security podcasts out of there. Of course. But uh, not operations, because operations isn't sexy, <laughs> right? So I wanted to fill that void when we started this show, and you wanted to fill that void when you wrote the book, and it seems like you did a good job. I don't well, I don't know. The, the jury's still out on whether we, we did a good job or not. <laughs> well, I mean, I was recently, I mean, I'm sure we'll talk about Tribe of Hackers at some point, but uh, I was doing another interview for, for Tribe of Hackers recently, and it, it did ask, like, you know, if you had to be blue team, like, what would you be like the first thing you did? And I was like, well, one, I would like run screaming into the night and become a janitor because like blue team is just so hard. I did it when I first got out of college. Um, and you know, we just ran up against so much of like, we didn't have the power. It was like, everybody had more power than us. So it was like, we really need to fix this. People were like, no, won't. And then, you know, they were like higher up the food chain. So it was like there, I mean, there was, you know, the pushback from, you know, just about everybody else as well as, you know, not having enough budget and, you know, having to fix everything as opposed to, you know, me on the attacking side, I really only need to find one thing wrong. Um, yep. So I really have a lot of respect for people who do, you know, the operations and the defensive side. Like you guys have like the most thankless and the most important job that's keeping, you know, things running in the world. If it's not people like me who are like, oh, I broke this thing. It's people who are, you know, day to day, like grinding out, keeping things running with, you know, I mean, people like are like, oh, they're just so cool. But nobody ever says that about the, you know, defensive operations people. But you guys are the really cool ones. I think the, well, that's appreciated. The, the best <laughs> the best compliment I've ever heard. Um, so a, a buddy of mine and, and, and uh, Nate knows him as well. Um, switched from uh, uh, red teaming, um, sort of gave up in a lot of travel. So he kind of wanted to spend yeah. a lot of time with his family. So he, uh, he switched idea. over to a blue team job. And uh, um, I, I think he was only doing the two, less than a month. And I was chatting with him and he just, he sort of looked at me and said, he's like, I, I'm blue team now. How the hell do you guys do this? This is insane. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, I, I kind of went, I don't know. It just, you know, we just do that's my job. Like, <laughs> just the way you do it. <laughs> is, is it that hard? <laughs> so, well, so comparatively um, it is definitely. <laughs> so, so you, you, you mentioned, uh, you mentioned tribe of hackers. So I will, Ooh. I will ease into uh, moving Good over transition. to that topic now. Yeah. It's Good a great transition. transition. <laughs> um, so you mentioned Marcus Carey earlier uh, doing mock 37 mm -hmm. as well. Um, and I believe he's, uh, he's central to this whole tribe of hackers thing. So mm -hmm. why don't you uh, uh, give us sort of an overview of what that was and, and what your contribution was? Well, you know, I get asked to do like interviews for people who are doing like a website or a book or whatever all the time. So, you know, it was Marcus and I knew him. So, you know, I did it. I answered some questions, but, you know, as usual, I, I kind of forgot about it. And then like, you know, maybe like nine months later. Or so, um, you know, it's like the book was coming out and they were donating everything to charity. And like a lot of people were talking about it. And I was like, whoa, this is like huge. He's going to have more sales than I do um you know we're so competitive in this industry but uh yeah it's uh I think there's like about 70 people in it um and it's all and it's you know people from you know the offensive side the defensive side research people from all over the world um and you know he really focused on you know it not all being white dudes <laughs> um so you know we've got there's a lot of diversity there's a lot of women um and of course, you know, people are like, oh, I didn't get included. That book is stupid. But I don't know. You know, I was happy to be included. And I know, you know, if, if we took everybody who deserved to be in a book about hackers, you know, we would have a book that spanned from one side of this room to the other at the very least. So, you know, it happened. It sounded, it sounds like he's doing another, if I understood correctly, it sounds like there's another book coming out with, with another set of hackers um, um, potentially, but I'm not. Uh, I may be misunderstanding what he's up to. I'm not entirely um, sure what's been made public. There's definitely going to be more, but I'm not really sure how much he said about it. But this is not the end of Tribe of Packers for sure. So that no, no, <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, it, it clearly, um, you know, something maybe we don't. But uh, 
Yeah, uh, I'm yeah, not I sure definitely heard he's made public yet, so I won't. Yeah, say, there, there's but... <laughs> there's definitely I can't I can't remember where I saw it, but I, there was definitely a note that there was there was more coming. Um, I mean, I wasn't in the first book. Uh, I still think the first book was brilliant. So you know, maybe I'll make it into book, you know, fifty or sixty or so. Um, but uh, uh, in <laughs> in addition to the book, um, it sounds like he turned it into, or it sounds like he turned it into a conference as well. Um, it doesn't sound like it. It, it happened. Yeah, no, no, <laughs> it, it happened. Yeah, it happened. So uh, which was last month, I believe. Yeah, uh, or maybe it was, yeah, the, it was very, like, maybe it was the beginning of the month. The very end of May, or the very beginning of May. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Did and you, uh, and Jason, and did I, you in, did you include a link to the uh, the YouTube recording in the I show will. notes? I will. We'll have to make um, sure we add that because there were some really 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 good talks in there. I, yeah, I, uh, I tuned into it just to see your talk in preparation for this show, and I ended okay. up getting sucked in and watching three hours of it. So yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> the, the YouTube link may be like six hours long. Yeah. Um, yeah, someone needs to um, hire an editor. Yeah, but but hey, I mean, it was you know, it, it's it's good because you end up watching a really a lot of really good talks. Yeah, no, um, it was good. It was good stuff. But uh, but you gave what what sounded like a brilliant talk, um, and and you know, I really enjoyed it. So uh, I would love to hear what you thought of of the audience response and and sort of what you talked about. Um. Well, yeah, the Tribe of Hackers Summit was a really interesting conference because it was you know, kind of had the same aims as the book, like, you know, helping people get into security. So I've always done, you know, very, very technical talks. I mean, I've done keynotes where you kind of have to, you know, a little higher level, but I mean, I'm still talking like really tech. And so this was going to be the first talk that I had ever given that, you know, wasn't technical. And, but I thought this was the right venue for it because it was, you know, a lot of like, how do we, how do people get into security? And, you know, I wanted to do kind of like, well, this was kind of my path and it's completely random, but you know, if I can do it, anybody can kind of thing. Like, uh, you know, talking about my journey and you know, how everybody's journey is going to be different. Um, so yeah, I definitely went over time a little bit on it. Um, and I also definitely forgot my lines in the middle of it. Um, and apparently, nobody noticed but i did um so i just kind of like started making it up as i went along about you know 15 minutes in but uh yeah i talked about you know my i guess background of you know i did have my mom who had a phd in computer science but i was also from mississippi so i always say i'm lucky i can read um but uh yeah i talked about you know how i got into security and i talked about you know, some of the dark stuff as well. You know, I talked about, um, like, you know, Me Too and, and things like that. Um, you know, I talked about, you know, I actually even put up, like, you know, I mean, what was it? Those people, I can't even remember what they're called. The, like, ill mob people who, like, the reporter wrote me and, and sent me, like, the screenshots from it and, like, wanted to know if I had any comment on it. So I actually, like, had them in the deck and was, like, reading off what people said. And I'm like, you know, the sad thing is at this point, this doesn't even really bother me anymore because people have just, like, slung things at me so many times that I'm like, you know, if they haven't destroyed my career yet. Um, but, you know, it's I guess the point was, yeah. Unfortunate side effect of being on the internet, it seems. Yeah, it's just that, uh, the, the higher mm -hmm. profile you are, the bigger target you are, and the more violent people get. I get the same thing. Um, I run a YouTube channel that's unrelated to... Uh, uh, to, to, to technology and some of the comments I get on there are just like so hateful it, and it's there's no reason for it there's just no yeah. reason for it there's no reason I to hate like, people like that. I feel like a lot of the distinction is that you know I think everybody gets a lot of hate from like randoms hiding behind random like uh like handles or whatever but what I really see in infosec and I can I've been in infosec mostly all my careers this may be true in like every industry but it's like you know it seems like at least for me it's really different when like someone whose work i respect a lot and who also you know has a really high profile is like using their real name and saying like georgia stuff sucks or georgia sucks or this and i think there's a lot of that in this industry that you know i kind of think we really need to get over it you know we're all ultimately on the same side like yeah. why do we have to have all this infighting so much it's like our goal at the end of the day is to make the world more secure. We would be able to get a lot farther if we were all working together as opposed to like trying to tear each other down all the time. 
Absolutely. So, yeah. Yeah. But yeah, what's I mean, interesting about it, like, let me say one more thing about this. I don't think ahead. I said it in the talk, but when the ill mob stuff came out, um, a lot of people who were like mean to me, like, you know, right after, you know, cause I, uh, you know, at a conference in 2013, I bashed a guy's head in because he tried to rape me. And uh, then like, I guess- How dare you. Yeah, I know it was awful. <laughs> I still have the coffee cup I did it with, no less. I stole it from the hotel. I should come like arrest me for stealing. Um, <laughs> it's like a souvenir. <laughs> yeah, it's a souvenir, exactly. Okay. Um, but yeah, um, so I mean, kind of after that, like, you know, there was a whole online debate of like, is Georgia a liar who like did this for publicity or like, did this really happen? And if this did really happen, what did Georgia do to deserve it? You know, the kind of like before me to the kind of stuff that people just talked about and it was okay to talk about it that way. Um, and nobody really complained. But a lot of the people like, you know, these, you know, I guess this was what, 2019. So like, what, six years later, um, you know, a lot of the people who were the most vocal about Georgia sucks and everything Georgia's ever done is sucked and Georgia needs to be thrown out of the industry back then were like messaging me and being like, I'm really sorry about what happened back then. So it actually like by ill mob, like reigniting this, they actually like allowed me to like mend fences with people that. I hadn't talked to in a really long time because I, you know, wow. thought they were jerks. So, I mean, thank you guys at Ill Mob because, you know, now <laughs> I have a lot more friends. <laughs> so, yeah, that was really interesting that it was like, you know, when it kind of like reignited for like no reason other than because, you know, I tweeted something about DerbyCon shutting down that, uh, you know, a lot of people who had been really hard on me back then we're like i you know have grown up since then and realized that that was really wrong of me i would appreciate it if you forgive me and we could be friends and i'm like for sure man <laughs> so yeah it was actually i mean in a lot of ways it was really nice i mean also kind of sucked because it's like you know generally when reporters write me i like expect it to be about something technical i would really you know about fell off my chair when a reporter's like i saw something on facebook that i would like like your input on, I thought it was a security issue. And then there's like these screenshots of all this, like, you know, R rated stuff that like didn't even happen. And I was like, Oh God. So yeah. I mean, some people need to grow up, but I mean, that's, you know, I mean, there was a lot of talk about it then, you know, people were like, I was just in the group because it was like the only way to get like security news. And I'm like, uh, there's a lot of ways to get security news that don't involve like, you know, having to at least be bystanders about, you know, attacking minorities and women. <laughs> yep. Yep. Yeah. There's, there's, I mean, I don't know. I, I don't know if it's just the, the current times or if it's the, um, you know, how social media has gone. There's a lot of, there's a lot of shit out there now. Um, you know, I mean, I, yeah. I've, I, I became aware of you, uh, I think around the first Derby con, um, yeah, I yeah. spoke at the first Derby Con. Yep. I did, and yep. my little white hat that they yep. had. Yeah. You were running around with. Yep. Uh, um, I think you had a uh, a camera case. You were running around with. And oh there was, yeah. There was, a, there was rumor that you were you were playing with uh, uh, GSM uh, stuff. Yeah, yeah everybody that, said that, that, but it was totally just it was like your camera. my camera case. Yeah, I, I, yeah. I, the, it's a tie. I don't remember if we went up and talked to you or not, and, and I like did. asked you about it. Did you? I did. Okay. I, I I remember it. Was like you and I were about to run, rush out the door, and I I saw Georgia sitting on her camera case. It's a good <laughs> and chair, I, I man. Walked, I walked up and I'm like, "What's in that case? <laughs> like, should I? Should we be yeah. afraid of that?" And you're like, "It's my camera." Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, a ton of people did at that con. They were like, what is it you have in there? And I'm like, literally, it's just my camera case and it makes a really good chair. Like, I didn't want to check it with the hotel because it's expensive, yeah. you know. Yeah, right, I'm right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so I mean, I saw you, I saw you that Derby Con, and then I guess I think it was Nate, it was the third one. So I did the, the first the, one, the second one, and the third one. Yeah. Okay. I so I the think the third, three. the third one was the the ill fated one. Yeah, um, it's the ill fated one. Yes. Uh, I think you came you came in from overseas. Uh, mm -hmm. you had just released the mobile pen testing framework. Yeah. Uh, you were taking a ton of shit because it was written in Perl. Um, mm -hmm. which yeah. by the way, like you know what? Um, honestly, you wrote it. They didn't. And if they didn't like it in Pearl, they should have wrote their own damn framework. Look, well, I've, I, written a, I've written a I ton of it. 
I did get it, and it's now written in Python. Thank you very much, people. You should have picked <laughs> some real obscure language and written it in that. So it's yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah. I wrote, I rewrote it in brain fuck just because, you yeah. know, why not? <laughs> yeah. Um, but it, you know what? Like, I mean, at, at the end of the day, like, I heard all this, this going on, and there was a lot of hate in there, and it was, you know, all I could think was like, yeah, but she wrote it and you didn't, so I'm not sure what you're bitching about. Like yeah. that's sort of <laughs> nonsense to complain about what language she wrote it in. If you think it's yeah, bad, I thought write was ridiculous. Well, um, I mean, it's really, you know, as I've, I guess, grown up more, cause I mean, part of it was that I, you know, I was really young then. And I mean, it did really kind of seem like the end of the world, but you know, as I've gotten older, it's kind of been like, well, I guess it wasn't the end of the world, but at the same time, you know, at the time people are like, Oh, it's no big deal, but it certainly felt like a big deal at the time. So, you know, I really, you know, watch out for people who are being attacked and, you know, if they're struggling, you know, rather than be like, you know, send them Taylor Swift ly lyrics, like shake it off, shake it off. It's like, you know, it's not really that easy to shake it off. So, I mean, I, I generally, you know, try and look out for something like that where, you know, people are being like having people pile on them again, particularly people who are like, you know, well known in the industry, like coming out and being like, your stuff sucks. It's just like, you know, that cuts you through the heart, especially yeah, if it's like somebody you've really looked up to and wanted to be like and wish this person would be your friend and they're like getting online and like like taking everything you've done and just dissecting like, it into why you basically don't deserve to be in the industry. I just don't understand why people like take the time. Now I kind of laugh about it because it's like, you know, when people like, because now my stuff's compiled now that it's a product. And then like some guy from InfoSec, I don't even know who it was, but he was like working at a company we were talking about partnering with and he like reverse engineered it and like had this list of like, why Georgia stuff is stupid. And it's like, you really took all that time out of your day to like decompile my stuff and like find things wrong with it. <laughs> really wow. get a life. I mean, I, I don't understand. <laughs> like I, I get it. There, there are, there are people in any industry who write, you know, like, not great software, right? Yeah. There's no reason to tear them to pieces. Yeah. Why not, why not help them? Why not improve the situation? Like maybe yeah. they had a great idea and they're just not a good developer. Maybe yeah. they are a good developer and need an idea. Like, why don't these people get together? And mm -hmm. like, why couldn't someone who wrote Python come to you and say, hey, I see you wrote it in Perl. That might not be a great choice. Let me help you rewrite it. Instead of tearing you to pieces, it doesn't make any sense at all. It's way easier to tear somebody to pieces. Yeah, it is. So it like is a no lot easier to, to rip someone down. Yeah. Um, uh, I mean, regardless, I think what you did was brilliant. I think you've, oh, you. You, you started, you, you effectively started an industry at that point. Um, yeah. I, I don't yeah. think there was another mobile pen testing framework out there. No, there um, wasn't. I mean, you know, sometimes it sucks to be first, but like you did it. And then you know, that's just mm -hmm. sort of how it is. Yeah. yeah. Um, Trendsetters have a target know. on their back, right? <laughs> yeah. Yep. Uh, and I think, uh, uh, I mean, one of the, you know, this is somewhat, I don't know if it's a sore subject or not, but um, I mean, one of the reasons that we started having some of the the people on the, the show that we've had is is because DerbyCon's been shutting down or DerbyCon is shutting down. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I've been to all of them. Um, you know, I'm a white dude, so I don't... <laughs> Uh, I sort of don't fall into the any of the, the crowd that's sort of looked down upon at any point. Um, but I have a lot of respect for people that have gone and that and and sort of, you know, I can I don't know if I can relate, but I like understand issues that people have had and whatnot. But I mean, I'm curious what your thoughts are on the whole DerbyCon shutdown. I know the, the shit that's out there about, you know, it's because of this person or whatever. But I mean, in general, like, do you think this is is. I don't know. I don't want to put you on the spot. No, but, I mean, I'm ready to answer it, it. Well, no, I mean, like, it's it's kind of like, do you think this is a good thing? It's a bad thing? Like, what what is what's your honest, like, opinion of, of what has happened and transpired since then? Well, I mean, first of all, you know, like, I really liked DerbyCon a lot. And, it you know, in terms of, like, things that I regret in my life, like, I think, you know, things going so bad with DerbyCon is probably up there if like things I could change but you know again like I got I guess a lot of what I learned about the Me Too movement was like you know how I felt after you know I you know I always felt bad because you know I wasn't raped so like what did I have to be upset about but you know like 
it's still I was like getting panic attacks in crowds and things like that and kind of like, you know, on some level having a nervous breakdown. But I felt like, well, well, for one thing, it was like, well, I can't be crazy because the guy who says I'm lying says that I'm crazy. So if I am being a little crazy, does that mean he's right? You know, these kind of logical fallacies that you tell yourself. But, you know, with the Me Too movement, it's like, you know, people are actually talking about this stuff. And it's like, you know, other people who were in similar situations to mine were like, I felt the same way. This is normal. So, I mean, that really kind of let me take it in perspective that, you know, it wasn't just that I was being a train wreck or, you know, whatever they want to say, that it was like completely normal. And it's actually, you know, people should have been, you know, I mean, it's like, it's one thing to write on your Twitter that like, we support Georgia, rape is bad. Like, and it's, you know, actually a whole nother level to like actually be supportive of people who are like going through stuff like that. So, you know, it's again, I, if I could change pretty much anything in my career, it would not be like everything came to a head at a derby con, which was probably my favorite conference. All those people I like hero worshipped as I was coming up. And yeah, the fact that they all thought I was a train wreck. Uh, yeah, it probably, I'll say it right here and now, that was probably like the biggest hit ever and it sucks. Um, so yeah, I have a lot of respect for DerbyCon. It was one of my favorite conferences. I mean, I stopped going because basically, you know, the founders of it said I was a train wreck. So it was kind of like, whatever, um, you know, maybe I was, but who's never been a train wreck in their life? You know, what were you doing at 22 and 23? That was so great kind of thing. Um, so I mean, I, I totally respect that, you know, them shutting down, you know, I know it's a lot of work, especially as it's gotten bigger, you know, running a con and, you know, I think conferences in general have gotten to be a lot harder and, you know, I respect that it is really hard. You know, you've got a lot of jerks on one side and you've got a lot of people who are very vocal about, we don't like people being jerks to us on the other side. And then you've got a ton of people who are just totally normal and they're like to have fun. And I think that, you know, it's really hard to be like running a conference in this climate altogether. Cause again, you've got, I mean, the, the people who are jerks are louder than ever. And the people who don't want to be treated like crap because they're female or are black or whatever are louder than ever. So, I mean, I totally respect that. Like, I mean, they've all got a lot going on. I mean, when they started this, like how many years ago, like, you know, I think that was before, like, you know, trusted sec even started. Now it's like, you know, a very like well-respected company. I mean, they may just not have time for it anymore and that's yeah. perfectly acceptable. Like I don't have any problem with it shutting down. I mean, I'm actually really sorry about it because like, I guess in my like list of like things that would be awesome that I dreamed about, you know, I guess I kind of dreamed about the day that like I would be redeemed and that they would ask me a keynote, <laughs> even though I know that would never happen. But you know, that like things would get better to the extent that, you know, one, I would be cool enough to keynote a conference that big and two, that they would want me. Um, so I'm sorry that it's shutting down because that'll never happen now. Um, but again, I totally respect them getting shut it down. The problem that I had with it was like, if you read the original post, you know, I mean, they like, they said that that's not what they meant and you know that's fine but i mean these are not media unsavvy individuals let's be honest these people you know they know what they're doing and you know the the original post really made it out to seem like you know that it was exactly what you know the mob on twitter you know ran with that you know the women killed our fun because you know they don't want to be harassed at the con and you know it sounds a lot like you know uh what is it ethics in uh, video game journalism so i really i wasn't okay with the fact that they were like basically you know doing every they everything they could uh you know either on purpose or just like by not paying attention um to like incite a riot against women i mean you saw it like any woman who had ever said anything is against very con um you know they were just turning into memes you know like they like turned that one girl into like a steamboat and called her like battle cunt or whatever can i say that on here but i mean that's what they that's what they said and i mean it you know and then i mean part of the reason why i tweeted because i saw these other you know women who did not have the same like following as i did had not been all through this before and were like really upset by the amount of like hate they were getting about this like and so I was like, well, maybe if I say this like kind of divisive thing that's 
true, um, then, you know, maybe that'll get some of the ire thrown at me instead. Um, but, you know, so everybody's like, Georgia hates DerbyCon, but that's actually like the opposite of the case. George is incredibly jealous of anyone who's, you know, never been called a train wreck by the founders of DerbyCon. Um, so, yeah, I love DerbyCon a lot. And I know that's probably surprising for many listeners to hear, but I guess at the end of the day, you know, that I would really wish it had turned out different than it did. <laughs> No, I think it's, I think it's, um, but yeah, I mean, in a way it's surprising. Um, in another way it's, it's sort of, you know, I, I, uh, I'm sorry you didn't make it back. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, absolutely. It was this year, but, um, but I mean, I think the CFP is still open. Uh, but, I mean, <laughs> at the end of May. <laughs> I mean, I could always like, uh, you know, send it a, a CFP under a different name. I could be Bonnie Jo Mason or something. There you go. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I, I I saw you, I guess it was the first three years I saw you at DerbyCon. And I haven't, yeah, I don't I think, think I've seen a live keynote you know, from you or a live uh, talk from you since. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I watched the, I watched the Tribe of Hackers talk. Um, you know, I think, I think what you've presented is amazing and brilliant and, and I'd like to see more. Um, I just, I, we don't apparently go to the same conferences. <laughs> um, you know, I, I, I only have a couple that I go to. Which yeah, is cool. I mean, like, <laughs> I mean, Jason, what you need to do is talk the people who, who are who are organizing B-Sides Delaware into having Georgia Keynote. Oh, somehow I don't think that will happen. I mean, <laughs> if you saw the, uh, if you saw the uh, I guess, after the Ill Mob stuff came out, I did a, and the DerbyCon stuff, I did a podcast um, with some people I know here from the DC investing community. They had me and Josh Marpet on, and I was, you know, talking mm. about why, why attacking women is bad, and you know, Josh was, uh, I mean, you can read the transcripts online. I don't want to hate on anybody. Yeah, Josh, I, mean, Josh to be Josh. Like, I know to be on that side. I mean, you're basically arguing something that is going to make you look bad no matter what. So, I mean, good for him that, you know, he took up that gauntlet to be the other side, but, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it, it didn't look too good on him and I don't think he's particularly happy about that because he would be. So somehow I doubt that I'm going to be in. Today. <laughs> I had no idea. Sorry. I didn't mean to bring it up. <laughs> no, it's fine. I, uh, love it. I think I look great. <laughs> I love I'm, that podcast. I'm, I'm, I'm the sort of person who is very <laughs> averse to drama. So whenever I see it online, I avoid it. <laughs> so like I, I I knew that there was a falling out with you and DerbyCon. I knew that there was this and there was that. I knew that you had, uh, you know, that that you were attacked, and I and I felt very bad for you in that. Um, but a lot of the details I've missed in a lot of these things. Um, so hearing it all again, I mean, it really makes me almost sad that I didn't uh, come out to support you more. Um, it's totally cool. Like you didn't. Yeah, me. but Is that me, you're in my good list. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't didn't attack you. At least what, it didn't go that way. Tomatoes are wonderful. You can make ketchup out of them. You can right, make sauce out right. of them. I mean, tomatoes are like they don't throw tomatoes so, at me. I don't have to buy. So the, 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 right, I'll the, throw the, tomatoes at you at your next talk. <laughs> the point I was trying to make there is that I didn't know that there was any sort of conversation between you and Josh <laughs> because I missed it. Because yeah, yeah. So, no, there um, wasn't so actually, actually there wasn't because they did it in two right. separate like uh, oh, interviews. Okay. So they okay. like put it together but yeah well josh was actually through mock 37 as well so i had known him through the security community and then i saw him at mock 37 as well but uh you know i mean i get the whole like you know there were a lot of people in ill mob who weren't necessarily participating in that sort of thing and you know they're thing was that you know we're not going to get to see you know the the zero days or whatever that people are putting and it's like well think about all the you know women and minorities who obviously are not even allowed in this group let's be honest and you know would either have to put up with watching this all the time if they could even get in in order to like see the security research that apparently is so great that you know we have to look the other way about a bunch of hate like you know, that's just another barrier to entry that's keeping, you know, all yeah. the white dudes like the best in the industry, so to speak. And that that shouldn't be shouldn't be the way it is. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm I, you know, I'm part of the staff on on B-Sides Delaware. Um, so, like, I know Josh. I'm friends with Josh. Um, no, he did not look wonderful <laughs> in that interview. Um, and and honestly, like, I mean, I'll say it like I think some of the stuff that he said was was tone deaf. And, and just wrong. Um, you know, I, on the one hand, I can understand, I, I sort of like, and this is 
don't yell at me. I sort of understand the argument of being in the group to get the information, but you're right. Like on the other hand, it's like, you know, like you have to speak up and say something like these people are acting like assholes. Like stop yeah. doing that. Absolutely. Um, and, and, and it's, it's hard. It's, you know, it is hard. It's incredibly you know, hard to stand up. You probably you know better than I do. Get, but... like, I mean, it usually like, honestly, when I ever, I stand up for something, uh, most of the time, you know, I'm glad that I did it, but I'm also like, my life would be so much easier if I would just keep my mouth shut and just mind <laughs> my own yeah, business. But on the other side of that, right? <laughs> so it, one, one thing that ignoring hate or ignoring um, the immorality does is normalize it. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I have two little kids, right? And if they do something that is wrong or if they do something that might hurt someone else or hurt themselves or offend somebody, if I don't tell them it's wrong, they're never going to know, right? So you got to tell them. Yeah. Well, with, with adults who have decided that it's okay to spread hate, if people don't resist that, then they think it's okay to keep spreading their hate because no one's stopping them. Or maybe they just fuel on the hate. I don't know. But uh, the point is, if a group of people just say, fine, you know, it's here, but we're going to participate because we get some benefit out of it. Um, and then the hate continues and none of those members say that hate's not all right. Then it's just going to keep going. And yeah. worst case, the people who are there for the good and don't like the hate might start to think that the hate is okay. And that's not good either. Yeah. I mean, it reminds me a lot of this like play I saw at the, a uh, fringe festival in Prague, which I know is like completely unrelated, but really did. <laughs> so when I was in Prague, like when I was in grad school, I was in like a summer school trip around Europe thing. We were in Prague and like the English speaking, like fringe festival was there and they were really cheap plays. So we would all like go and see them. And they had this one and it was like a one man show about Hitler, which, you know, um, so he did his like Hitler speech as Hitler and, you know, you saw it and it was like that. And then afterwards, you know, it's like the play is over, but the guy like sits down, you know, on his chair and just, you know, starts, you know, shooting the shit with us. And, you know, he just starts normal. And then he starts to tell like, you know, the kind of like funny off color jokes that pretty much everybody says and nobody thinks anything of and it just builds and it builds and it builds. And, you know, it gets to the point where he's like really offensive and like people are walking out and people are shouting at him and stuff. And it's like, do you really believe this? And it's like, you know, it just kept going and going. And then, you know, at the end of it, you know, the, the like Nazi symbol comes back on at the, and he's like, and that's how you let me in. And it goes black because, you know, you, nobody it's kind of how it even started there it's like it starts small it starts in nobody stopped you get him. used to it so yeah, you know that's... and then it builds and builds and it just seems normal so yeah not i mean it's hard to stand that's... up for anything because people jump down your throat but yeah if it, it just becomes normalized and that's how you know these sort of radicalized groups start that's that's brilliant it is that's, brilliant that, that, yes, I mean, that whole thing was part, like, of, the, was part of the act that was all part of the act brilliant. you thought the act was over and it wasn't it was it all wasn't. part of it well, it was all like he was showing like how that's like the whole like hitler speech sounded ridiculous that was like the whole it was like actual text from one of his speeches but then when he sat down and like started doing that it like actually made sense how like this person could actually get to that point so yeah like all these years later i mean this was like what i was in grad school like years and years ago and then i like still remember it it was, it was like one of the most like <gasps> moments of like my entire life like watching that yeah yeah I, I i i you know i know i know i know you've gone through sort of ups and downs and left and rights and i mean shit's been good and shit's been bad mm -hmm. um i mean i'm happy i met you years ago um I, I think you've done brilliant work since then your book is again your book is amazing I got it. I sort of went through it myself. And I mean, the first thing I thought was like, I, my son needs to have this. This is <laughs> thank the, you. He needs this book and he's got it. I um, really need to read the book. I, I have yeah, it and I started it. And then like everything else in life, I got distracted. <laughs> yeah. <I> like <laughs> <have> it. <laughs> you don't, you don't do well with books. Um, no, I don't. And, no, I don't. And, Can you make an I, audio I, book? I, would it would it work in an audio book? Probably oh, not. I would love to do an audio book. <laughs> Can we get like Stephen Fry to read it? <laughs> 
I and now click the start button. Yeah, yeah, right. I don't want Stephen Fry to read your book now. That's, <laughs> I don't know what the, I don't sure what would come out of that, but it would be brilliant. You do um, metasploits. <laughs> set I, uh, source. I, I I can't wait for the second edition. Um, I'm I'm a patron support Patreon supporter already. Um, oh, thank so, you. I appreciate. So that. I mean, pimp your pimp your stuff. Like you've got you got a Patreon for the book. Um, what else you got I out do. there? Um, so yeah, I have a Patreon for my book. Um, so it's just Patreon, however you spell it, dot com slash, you know, Jordan Weaver in my name. And yeah, I am using those funds, like, uh, time I spend working on the book, I'm not doing consulting. So, so I don't starve to death. Like I'm, you know, and you do get like perks, like you get in the acknowledgements, if you give anything, um, there's like exclusive content and things like that. Um, early access to the labs you can even like help me edit you know uh and there's even like a really high one if you give me like a really lot of money like i'll it'll be like your payment for me to come speak at your event or um you know i can like privately mentor you and stuff so i mean it's not just giving me money so it will get the the book out faster so i have that and i really appreciate everybody including you who has supported me with that um you know like i said i also have a product company um so you know if you're bored and just want to like try out a product and suggest things you think you would really like to see in it um you know i'd really love to hear from anybody you know we do do um free trials and they're online you don't have to download anything or anything you know you don't have to download the seven gig vm anymore you just you know we give you an online account um so you know if anybody wants to you know help me make my product better um if anybody you know works at you know either you know a consult security consulting company or a or their on-site security at an organization and that you know they'd like to bring mobility into their security testing um i'd love to talk to you um see how i could help um also if you're building any mobile security products you know from the um, you know, defensive side, uh, you know, I can certainly help there as well, you know, see how you're doing against like the real attacks and help you make it better. So if anybody who's listening is working in any of those spaces, um, again, I'd love to help, um, you know, at this point, I really just, you know, want to help, you know, by finding new partners and making my product better. So, you know, don't think it's going to be a ton of money because it's not, um, because I really just want to, you know, help people at this point. Um, and I'm able to do that because, you know, I'm the founder of the company, so I can do whatever I want, you know, within reason. It's good to be uh, the king. Yeah, it's good to be the king. Um, <laughs> but also heavy is the head that wears the crown. Right. Um, so, yeah. Um, so, yeah, those are the, the big ones. I mean, certainly if you need pin testing or security training or anything like that, um, I also – um, very, very soon we'll have out, um, hopefully by, well, the end of the month is coming, but hopefully by the end of the month, we're doing like the final tests on it. Um, you know, it, a lot of people are still using the, the first book and I do have a repo up with like all the ISOs and the, the Cali that's set up and everything and all the vulnerable apps. Cause like some of the places where they were online have died since, um, so I have a repo if you are like setting up the book still, but we are putting up um, online labs for it. This is going to be a tie-in with book two where we're going to have um, all your labs are going to be available online so we can do like, you know, active directory attacks and things like that that are a little harder to set up in your own lab, especially if you're a beginner. Um, but, you know, kind of as the trial of that, we are, um, we built one for all the labs in book one. Um, so that'll be out soon and you'll be able to just sign up. There will be a free trial on that. So, you know, if you're, if you're good at getting through books, you can do it for free, but you know, I, I am actually using somebody else's platform. So we do actually have to charge money eventually. Um, but yeah, it, ha it has everything for the first book on there. And there's also again, going to be additional exercises, which I mean, that's the goal with book two is, you know, you have the exercises that are in the book, but then, you know, it can organically grow so you can continue learning. Um, so, yeah, we're putting it up first for book one, basically, so we can get all the kinks out of it before book two launches. So look out for that. Um, you know, I know it's a pain to set up your own lab, especially like when the some of the links don't work. So, you know, we're we listen and we're fixing all that. Um, so, yeah, that's really all I can think of that I'm pimping right now. So yeah, look out for book two, look out for our labs. If you want book two faster, please donate to my Patreon. And yeah, if you have any mobile security testing needs, definitely reach out about my product. If you need just pen testing or training thing, reach out about my consulting. So yeah. <laughs>
Okay. And what is the best way for people to reach out to you for any of these? Um, well, I have uh, lots of different ways. I mean, email is probably the easiest. So I'm Georgia at bulb security, B U L B, like the light bulb security.com. Also, Georgia at shavira.com, which, like I say, is hard to say or spell. So it's H H, what S H E V I R A H. Even I have to think about it. But yeah, this is it's Georgia at bulb security because then you can spell it. <laughs> um, I also have Twitter, uh, you know, just my name, Georgia Weedman. So at Georgia Weedman, my DMs are open. Um, I do try to check those fairly um, regularly. So, you know, you can add me or DM me. Uh, I mean, I'm on other social media, but Twitter is probably the fastest one or. You know, you can friend me on Facebook. Uh, I don't look at LinkedIn as much as I should. No one does. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm always feel terrible. I'm like, I have 5 million new messages. Most of them are about people saying, like, happy work anniversary anyway, though. So, or you've been found in 28 searches. Yeah. yeah I get those too. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. And if I don't write back, if you write me, please don't take it personally because sometimes I miss stuff because I'm not perfect. It's totally not you. It's me. And just, you know, ping me again and say, Georgia, answer me. And I will. <laughs> Good call. All right. Well, uh, Jason, do you have anything you want to close with? No. Um, uh, it was awesome talking to you. And, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I, I mean, you coming on. It's been yeah, a good, it's been a good chat. It's I been a good chat. It. You're welcome back whenever. Okay. Well, thank you guys for having me. And I hope you guys have fun with the news. I'm actually going to take off and go back to work. My carbon black uh, keynote slides are due uh, by the end of the day today. That was probably five, but I don't think it's the end of the day until I go to bed. So there. The end of the day is midnight, obviously. So. <laughs> All right. Well, There's good always, luck with that. Always time to add more memes. <laughs> yes. All right. Bye. All right. Thank you guys. Yep. Night. Thanks. All right, that was fun. Now we should play transition music, right? Yeah, push the button. Here we go. One of these days, we'll figure out how the professionals actually have time slots set up on their shows so that things like don't overrun. We're an hour and 16 minutes in, and we're just finished with the interview. What's, what's a time slot? <laughs> I don't understand. Hey, weird, news. Weird stuff. Weird stuff. News. News. Yeah, news, I, don't, news. I don't know that I have any real announcements to, to go with tonight. Um, oh, I, didn't, I didn't look oh, up any reviews. Uh, we got a couple more uh, YouTube followers. That's about it. <laughs> um, well, we had YouTube followers, and then YouTube decided to, I'm sorry, Hangouts decided to do this thing. And now what we're a, on the wrong channel. And what a uh, pain in the butt. Yeah. So anybody who's watching us live tonight, which I don't know if anybody's really uh, caught up. I see a couple people in the chat. That's cool. Well, we're on my personal YouTube account because I couldn't get the channel to start to hang out on air because of some weird redirect loop that YouTube kept sending me into. So if any of you watching work for YouTube, go fix your crap. Sorry, if you work for Google, right? Google owns YouTube. Yeah. yeah so yeah, I, Hangouts uh, on Air is just broken as hell. Dang. So um, hopefully by next time we record, that's fixed. Then we can go back to publishing these on the Iron Sysadmin channel instead of my own personal YouTube account. Because no one's going to find this crap. <laughs> All right. Well, I think we'll cut the chat down and we'll get right to the news because, you know, eventually I'd like to go to bed tonight. <laughs> What's, I don't, I mean. Okay. I know it's weird. Sure. I know it's it's a strange thing, sleeping. Yeah, I uh, sleep. Ach. What's that? Playing the second uh, uh, transition really did seem silly, but it's all about the format, okay? It's all about the <laughs> format, okay? Yeah. I, you know. Totally. We have to have a transition between the middle section of the show and the news. Otherwise, it just doesn't work. So so it's funny. I mean, this this whole YouTube uh, sign in thing. I'm actually I'm 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 having this problem right now. I yeah. have I have a. I have one Gmail account that's actually it's a G suite account. So it has like it admin mm -hmm. privileges and all sorts of stuff. Yeah. Um, and then I have my my normal user account. 
it won't let me log into my user account because my user account is not a G Suite account and it won't, it doesn't, I can't get it to redirect me to the normal login. So yeah, uh, I, I totally wanted to post stupid comments on the YouTube uh, page and you couldn't get there because it won't let me log in. Yeah, so. it, that's exactly that's exactly it. I was trying to switch. I mean, for I don't want to get too much into the mechanics of YouTube, but basically channels are like sub accounts of an account, right? And all yep. of my sub accounts, all of my channels, uh, I can switch to them. But as soon as I try to start Hangouts on air, it goes into this weird redirect loop because I think it's trying to to authenticate as me instead of the channel. And then it goes into this loop and it doesn't open. So it's, hopefully it's they It's rough to fix be a that. YouTube star. It is. It is. It is. It's I more know. like I have YouTube ADD and I have way too many channels is what it comes down to. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. All right. We have news Let's talk to talk about. about. Let's do that. News. Yes. <laughs> uh, so um, last week uh, was um, Cybergeddon. Um, all of the all of the cybers are broken. Uh, yep. You should just turn your computers off, throw them in the garbage. Uh, don't worry, the dumpster's already on fire, and uh, just just you know go about uh, banging your drum and living in caves. So I I don't want to say I told you so, but you may remember when Spectre and what was the other one? Ghost was it Ghost? Meltdown. Meltdown. Uh, Ghost was something Ghost else. Was something else. Yeah. Meltdown. So when Spectre and Meltdown showed up, um, here on the show we said just wait. There will be more. <laughs> Hackers have now figured out. I can attack what? The CPU? Awesome. <laughs> yeah. Well, here yep. we are, guys. Here we are. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> Intel falls again. Um, so uh, the first the first couple links here are sort of all CPU attacks. Um, so the first one is uh, a site uh, MDS attacks um, because yet again, um, if you're going to find a vulnerability in something, uh, make sure you do it the proper way. Uh, find the vulnerability, do all of the research, alert the proper parties, and before you announce it, please make sure you have a proper name and yeah, an icon to describe your attack. Oh, uh, so so we've got, uh, we've got MDS attacks, uh, uh, specifically uh, RIDL or RIDL, Mm -hmm. uh, Rogue in flight data load is what it stands for, Riddle. and Fallout. Um, so both of these are, uh, if I understand correctly, I am not a CPU expert, by the way. Um, both of Weird. these are, uh, I believe, based on the same um, uh, uh, the hell's the name of the attack called? Uh, speculative execution. It's right oh, at the yes. beginning of the page. Um, they're both execution. speculative execution. It, it's like it's like the fourth word, speculative. Yeah. So <laughs> one of those so words. If I, by the way, if I understand correctly, this this basically has to do with the CPU um, guessing uh, or running multiple uh, pipelines at the same time of the data uh, in an attempt to to sort of guess what's going to happen next. Yeah. Uh, so that's what you're, you're, you're tricking the CPU. Yeah, that's what you're tricking the CPU into giving back. the wrong data back. Yeah, I, I read all up on what the heck speculative ex execution was back when Spectre hit because that was the same the same deal. You're basically trying to uh, now I can't remember exactly what the the attack vector was, but it was it had to do with these speculative branches uh, in the CPU, and you could use it to predict data or something. Right. Um, so there are uh, there are four new exploits. Um, I guess only two of them have names or they're they're sort of the parent names for a couple different types of attacks. Um, and there's also a second attack uh, that was reported, I think, independently called zombie load. Um, yep. And and what's interesting about zombie load is um, it's got it, a great logo. It does. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm, and this is why. This is why they go with logos. Uh, this is actually a pretty impressive logo. Um, I'm I'm impressed. It, uh, somebody like can it. work into that. Yeah, yeah. Um, somebody with a lot more artistic talent than myself. Um, so basically, what Zombie Load does is uh, it it sort of pulls data from the cache, I guess, that shouldn't be available, um, and shows it to you. So you can pull things like uh, browser history, uh, keys, passwords, you know, etc. Um, and as with uh, Spectre and Meltdown, um, these are 
full service exploits. Uh, they work on your personal computer and the cloud. Oh, good. Yes. Uh, and also, as with Spectre and Meltdown, fixing them is a CPU hit. So there's a. Yep. I, I don't have the. I don't have it anywhere specifically, um, but I believe it was somewhere between a five and ten percent hit on CPU to uh, when the patches were added. I don't have the article. Maybe I'll have to try to find it. But apparently, one of the outcomes of these two new attacks is that Intel is considering ditching hyperthreading. Really, I had not heard that. Yeah, I'll have to try to find the article. Um, uh, these are uh, so. I didn't cover this before. These are Intel attacks. These do yeah. not affect AMD. They do not affect ARM, um, and they don't affect other, you know, other processors uh, that are non-Intel. Remember all um, those years is, ago, all of us cool kids were running AMDs instead of Intels. Yep, yep. And so, then eventually, we yeah. all fell onto the Intel bandwagon because the prices came in line. Yeah, that's that's Kinda. not to say that um, it there are no vulnerabilities in no, those it's processors. Just that uh, um, yeah. This is this is much like the uh, Mac uh, Windows Linux yeah. uh, landscape, where you know what Microsoft has the go. the market Biggest share, market. and yep. attackers go after it. Yep. So Intel has the market share here; they're going after the Intel processors. Um, give it some time. AMD and ARM will both fall. Um, it's just it's inevitable. So uh, moving on, since we've talked about uh, how much market share Mar uh, Windows and, and Mac have, um, Linux has a nice remote code execution vulnerability um, yeah. that has been in place since version... It's like two uh, something, wasn't it? Two something, yeah, forever ago. It might be 2.0. Um, this is bleeping computer, by the way, folks. Right. Oh, yeah, attribution. Um, <laughs> so... There is a patch out for this. Um, I looked at it. Uh, the patch is a quite literally a 15 character change in the TCP.C uh, source code in the Linux kernel. Wow. Um, I've I've I don't know if this article goes into it very much. Um, this is not an easy attack. This is a very very difficult attack. Um, it is you know if you can pull it off you own everything but uh it's not something that's simple to to exploit um and some of the speculation or some of the commentary that's come out um since this has been reported is is that you know they're they're not sure that having this marked as such a critical vulnerability is worth it because you know it's not something that joe blow can just go out and take advantage of um but in in my worldview uh, it's remote code execution. Um, I think those are the ones that are, regardless of how hard it is to uh, to exploit it, um, those are critical. Go patch that. Yeah, well, I mean, most um, most CVEs have not just a, a criticality score, but they also have a, a ease of exploit score. So this seems like a perfect time to, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, they have a. It's hard to exploit, but it's really bad yep. if you do. It's a it's an exploit exploitability score of 2.2 and the impact score is 5.9. Um, I'm not sure what the max is for those, but it's, it's low, you know, it's, it's hard to exploit, but if you can exploit it, you know, like I said, you, you own the world. I believe it's up to 10 to scale is of it? one to 10. Yeah. Or zero so to 10. It's, it's Maybe not, I'm wrong. Uh, uh, it's, it's not, um, it's not trivial, but you know, it is what yeah. it is. I mean, re remote code execution in the kernel seems like a pretty big deal. Yep, yep. And uh, so continuing with the uh, the theme of the day, which is uh, the world's on fire. Um, uh, this one actually came out today. Um, oh, you mean we're current for a change? Yeah, we're current for a change. Uh, there's a, a new sensor calibration attack on oh, right. Android and iOS devices. Um, hey, um, you, you forgot. Uh, it's from CDNet. Yes, it's from ZDNet. Oh, <laughs> doing that attribution thing again. I'm bad at this. Uh, this is why I am not a uh, reporter. Uh, so uh, Android yeah. and iOS devices impacted by new sensor calibration attack. Now, I I, I think it's a stretch to call this an attack. Yeah, um, it's more like fingerprinting, don't you think? Yeah, it, it, it is. It's basically passive fingerprinting at that. I even call um, it new device fingerprinting technique. 
Yeah. So the um, if you've if you've had a uh, a mobile device of some sort, um, there's a way you, you you sort of calibrate the sensors that are in there. Um, it, you used to do it, uh, if I remember correctly, in the old um, the old uh, Android tablets. You actually had to touch the different parts of the screen to sort of calibrate the sensors. A lot of that is done in the factory now, um, but those those calibrations can be retrieved remotely um, by browsers and, and uh, applications. And yeah, there it, there's a, there's a pattern to them. So you can, you can identify just like you can identify like the, the type of a browser or um, if you're, if you're receiving traffic from a, uh, a machine based on how the, the packets are built, you can sometimes detect what, what the OS is underlying. Yeah. Um, this is the same sort of thing, and this this lets you identify what sort of a device it is, and then track that device. Um, and uh, I don't know; um, it doesn't really seem to say whether or not it's unique enough to identify per person or per device. Uh, but you can at least identify the type of device. So. So basically, um, I mean, what did that really get you, right? So you can across across the wire figure out that I'm on an iPhone eight. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, yeah, I guess. Um, like, I don't understand how that's even all that. I guess. Eh, I guess if you could use that data to somehow then craft no, an exploit it, that works against that or something, like a, what? It, there, there, it is. I found it. It, it is a unique ID, so it is uniquely oh. identifying each device. Oh, okay. So it's um, not like I know you're on an iPhone eight. I know you're on this iPhone eight. Right. Um, Apple has patched it. Uh, so you 12, could, you could then track it. someone from website to website or something like that. So, right. Yeah. Right. Okay. Whether they're whether they're uh, in uh, incognito mode or not. Um, so Apple Apple added random noise to the calibration output uh, in iOS twelve twelve, which was released a couple months ago. Um, cool. Android is uh, Android is I don't know what they're doing. They're they're still investigating apparently. Android is hoping that they can use the data to track their users better. Uh, maybe they already were, and they're they're sort of upset that somebody figured it out. <laughs> um. All right, so uh, I'm gonna reorder things because I'm a pain. Um, continuing on with the uh, world is burning. Um, Microsoft released a patch for a uh, a bug that uh, is wormable uh, in RDS. Um, this was uh, again. This was last week. Last week was a really really bad week for Infosec uh, and systems people in general. Um, it's, it's, it's about patching all the things, no matter what the OS is. Um, so RDS had a nice vulnerability, uh, where you could remotely execute code through RDS, which is the remote desktop service, uh, on, uh, windows seven windows server. Oh yeah. And windows XP. Um, oh, is this, is this the worm one you were talking about? Yeah. Yeah. So Microsoft, Microsoft actually released a patch for windows XP. Um, after saying they were no longer going to patch XP. I Apparently, actually, it's, it's that bad. I heard about this on the news, like the normal every mor every day morning news. <laughs> right. Like not technology yep. news, just like, hey, Microsoft patched Windows XP. Like, what? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The normal, you know, yeah. something that, 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 you know, people like you and me go, wait, isn't that out of... Wait, yeah, what? one, one, why am I hearing about a patch for Windows XP on the morning news? Two, I thought they didn't support that anymore. <laughs> yeah. Yep. So, uh, hey, um, here's a thought. If you have RDS, stop exposing it to the internet. What an idea. What an idea. Now, in the case of a worm, though, that could easily go tearing through like a server environment or something. You know, right, where, but, where but remote it's... desktop is open for management, right? Right. But again... Why do you have obviously. remote desktop open to the internet? Well, no, it doesn't have to be open to the internet. Well, right. If it's if it's on your internal network. Right. If somehow it gets into your internal network. I'm not saying that's an easy feat. I'm saying that it it's, could be a bad thing. That's all. 
True. Yeah, the, as a secondary sort of add-on attack. Yeah. Um, but stop stop exposing RDS to the internet. Um, Shodan says you still are, so don't lie to me. Yeah, Shodan uh, still. Yeah, obviously yep. there's a bunch. Yep. Um, now, uh, in a slight change to the uh, horrible, horrible news of the past couple of weeks, um, yeah. we've uh, we've solved security. Oh yeah, how's uh, that? So, uh, um, who was this? University of Michigan um, announced that they have uh, created an unhackable processor architecture. Well, well, good. They called it Morpheus because the matrix is awesome. The matrix is awesome. Um, basically, is this, I, is, this, is this kind of like unbreakable? Yeah, I, I'm sort of thinking <laughs> it is. Um, what it does is it. it it reshuffles, so encrypts and reshuffles the uh, the memory, I guess, or the the ac the the way that you access memory every twenty to, or every fifty milliseconds. Um, so it's kind of rearranging the memory constantly, um, which makes me think there's going to be some sort of a CPU hit there. But yeah, maybe it, it's that fast. It doesn't matter. This is like um, ASLR um, address yeah. space. Layout, randomization. Layout, randomization, yeah. Um, so it's it's basically ASLR on like speed, um, where instead of like ASLR today is it it sort of randomizes things and it's done. Yeah. Um, it says, "Hey, I'm random, and I did it again and again and again and again and again and again." Um, but the part of this that bothers me is like they say this is unhackable, and and of course that's just a call to action. Um, yeah, exactly. The, the part that bothers me is like something has to know how to get to the memory, right? You can't just yeah. have random memory. Why not? Um, you just have to. It's sh it's, it's like when you <clears throat> drop a deck of cards, and whenever you need to find the card you need, you just shuffle through them until you find the one you need. You don't have to right. know where it is; you just find right. it. Right. You, you. But in this case, you only have fifty milliseconds to do it. Um, I, I feel like processors are fast. They can do this kind of stuff. <laughs> if I was an attacker. My immediate thought would be, "Oh, I'm just going to go attack the thing that tells me where the memory is." Yeah, where's the table that tells me where the memory is? <laughs> right, right. Like that's just that's my listen, answer. But hey, listen, the table is also unhackable. Ah, did you read? That's it randomized says, too. It says on yeah. So the the table is unhackable, and then the or the table uh, is random, and then the other random. Uh, you have to hash the algorithm of how many random things there are, and that's the table, and then. Uh, the then that table is also uh, random, but there's like a a pigeon that flies in with a sticky note and shows you. Okay, I've gone off the rails. <laughs> you, you you you. This sounds like a Kickstarter. There's a pigeon involved in. Yeah, this, this, this sounds like. A, okay, everybody needs to support Nate's new Kickstarter. <laughs> the pigeon CPU. Pigeon pigeon CPUs. Pigeon pigeon um address space randomization. <laughs> <laughs> um so anyway this is uh this is a thing now um and and of course you know it goes into uh depth about telling you how awesome this new slr randomization thing is and, and it's got tell a picture of Lawrence Fishburne the header so i mean yep and, and doesn't <laughs> tell you at all what the architecture of the cpu is or what it's compatible with so well, no it's that's um, because nothing's compatible with it yet and obviously microsoft is going to jump on and so is linux and everybody we're, we're going to we're good we're, we're, those intel amd uh, war that's the thing of the past we're going to all be on a hack on uh, unhackable morpheus processors by the end of the year okay i'm game uh, that's my that's just, my uh that's my prediction i take i'll take which, which color pill am i taking <laughs> Uh, red, the red pill. Red, red pill. Okay, sounds yeah. good. See, really, what this means is that we're all in the matrix, and processors aren't even real anyway. There is no processor. I thought that was a spoon. Yeah, I know, but see, I'm trying to make it about the the article and oh, okay, pigeons. I got it. Right, <laughs> articles. Uh, so Baltimore is apparently being held hostage. Yeah, man, man, you included way too much news tonight. I did. It just you guys are getting all the news today. tonight, and we're tearing through it in record time. It's been like we are, we are, like it's, twenty minutes. <laughs> uh, guess what happened to Baltimore? Uh, ransomware. Let me, let me, ransomware. Let's spin, spin the wheel of compromise. By the way, yes. the wheel of compromise is all ransomware. <laughs> yep. Yep. 
So uh, they've been infected with Robin Hood. That's the best name for ransomware ever. Yeah, and uh, they, they want. Uh, by the way, what's what's <laughs> so this happened apparently two weeks ago. Yeah, um, and, and they refused uh, to pay, which is you know good on them. And uh, and yeah, Baltimore refused to pay. So the the thirteen Bitcoin um, ransom, which was uh, seventy six thousand dollars when they got infected, is now up to one hundred and two thousand dollars because the price of Bitcoin has gone up. A Bitcoin lot. has gone up. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so. Wow. Um, so, uh, yeah, I guess I guess Baltimore's kind of screwed at the so moment. So what they need to do is ride the wave until Bitcoin drops again. Then they can pay less. That could do that. I mean, uh, Bit Bitcoin's doing interesting things these days. It's it's bouncing back and forth between seven and eight thousand dollars a coin. Wow. Um, so, so I uh, I think a lot of this has to do with our next uh, story, which we'll talk about in a second, but. Um, yeah, Bitcoins don't buy now. Don't, whatever you do, do not buy Bitcoin right now. Oh, but um, obviously it's going to just keep going up. No, right? I, I'm not so sure about that. Maybe, <laughs> but I'm not so sure about that. That was from uh, by the way, folks. That was yeah, that was slash that. Okay, you missed it fine. again. Did you report on any of the other ones that no, you know no, where no, they okay. were from? While I was busy uh, dealing with my daughter checking in the door and my wife outside the window. Oh, see, <laughs> I flipped between the screens and I missed all of that. I would have made comments. You did. Okay. From CNBC, I did it. I did it. This next you one. You did. Uh, you good job. Did. Good job. Uh, so the U.S. is considering blacklisting another massive Chinese vendor. Uh, this time, Hikvision. Um, I'd never heard of these people when you told me about this. Yeah. Uh, the the difference is that um, you, you may not have heard of them, but I I can almost guarantee you've used hardware from them. See, they do um, like surveillance cameras or something. There's there's a lot of surveillance camera stuff uh, that they do. Um, I know that a a surveillance system that we had installed in an office was all Hikvision. Uh, the cameras okay. had chips from them. And, I've I've never um, dealt with a security system, so maybe that's why. You know. So this this follows on the uh, the tale of um, the U.S. blacklisting uh, Huawei. Yeah. Um, which. Uh, I'm not, I, you know, the, the Huawei saga is so weird. Um, I mean, we go back months ago when the, what was it? The C CFO got yeah. arrested um, yeah. in like Canada or something. And then, and then China responded by arresting a bunch of Canadian citizens. Um, and it sort of went back and forth. And this has actually turned more recently into um, a trade uh, yeah. battle. Yeah. Now they're talking about national security and yeah. So, so I don't know if, if you remember, I'm sure you do three, four years ago, maybe longer. There was that whole scandal where, uh, Huawei devices had built in ransom spy ransomware or spyware. They were like an, yep. an Android device or something. Yep. Is, is this fallout from way back then? Or is this literally just political BS? I'm not sure if that. So I think I think the CFO getting arrested is a different. I think that's different than the current fallout of them being blacklisted. There's there's some commonality there in that there's a fear that um, the devices that Huawei is selling are compromised by design. Yeah. Um, specifically, well, I mean that, that was exactly what the right. what the deal with that Android device was. But the that current Design. Right. The current, the past, I don't know, couple of weeks of Huawei in the news, yeah. I think is purely political. Um, um, the government fighting with China about tariffs. Because it's um, it's really weird how they're focusing specifically on Chinese companies. Yeah. Yeah. When there well, are that, lots that's, of that's, that's the I trade mean, war. China, China is sort of a maybe arguably the biggest tech giant. But uh, the whole thing seems very politically charged. Well, the, and the politically charged piece of it right now, I think, is this whole trade war that's going on. Yeah. Which is why, I mean, yes, Huawei was sort of the the whipping boy to begin with. Um, and I think there's, I think potentially by right, they should have been because of some of the stuff that happened with them on the yeah. security side. Yeah. But I think that that has been a convenient, um, they're, they're a convenient target now that we've moved into this whole trade war thing. 
right. between you know the White House and 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 China's government. Um, but Huawei is not. I mean, Huawei has never, never. I mean, Huawei hasn't been innocent for a long time. I remember when I when I first got into, um, sort of into uh, carrier based tech back in. Uh, I don't know. This is twenty years ago. Um, there was a there was a big thing with Huawei um, where they had they had copied Cisco's iOS or or reverse engineered it or something to do with with Cisco and their iOS and how Huawei basically had the exact same thing on their routers. Yeah. Um, and it was it was a big deal back then. Like this was a huge huge thing. Mm -hmm. Um soon followed like a year later by everybody having Cisco iOS interface, but whatever. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, I mean, uh, I've known about Huawei from a long time ago. Yeah. A, a, a lot of places mimic iOS because it's what network engineers are used to and they want you to feel at home on their command line. But yeah, I mean, uh, maybe there was more to Huawei. Maybe they thought there was actual literal like copyright infringement there and not just them trying to be the same. I don't know. I, I, I don't know anything about that particular, uh, fight yeah i think i think back when that was going on originally um cisco either thought they had a a copyright on their on their interface or i, I mean i don't i'd have to do some digging to figure it out but i think what came of that whole thing was that um it was sort of revealed that you couldn't copyright a, a an interface like that um, and that's why a lot of other companies ended up with that interface. Either that or yeah, I mean, or the other way where they could copyright it and Cisco has licensed it to like everybody in creation. How do you how do you copyright a command line inter interface? Right. I mean, like I, that's that's sort of at the core of all computing history. I don't know. <laughs> I do not know. Um, but I know that that that, you know, years ago, that was a that was a thing. Um, so at any rate, Huawei and now Hikvision, I guess Huawei is is already being been, what's the word I'm looking for? Blacklisted or, or whatever. Blacklisted, yep. Um, and I guess Hikvision is next on, on target. I did hear, I think this morning or the day before, that they're talking about rolling back a little bit of that blacklist so that companies that were already dealing with Huawei could continue to in some aspects. But I, I don't know the details. Yeah, there's, a, there's another article I stumbled over um, that that had said that I think Intel, AMD, and a bunch of other companies had stopped, uh, uh, had, had sort of issued a uh, stop order of any dealings with Huawei at all based on the, yeah. the blacklist. And I, I mean, think that was from yesterday or today. So Google's worked pretty closely with Huawei. Uh, a number of the Pixel and Nexus devices were Huawei, uh, it's hard to say, Huawei uh, hardware. So and I remember when this news article came out, it was right around the time that Google was starting to use them as a hardware vendor. And I'm like, wow, that's I, I've I've lost a bit of faith in the, <laughs> in the the Nexus line. But yeah, uh, the, there's uh, been no Reuters, evidence that Reuters reported on the 19th um, that Google suspended business with Huawei yep. of anything that was not open source. Yeah, I heard that too. So so basically, um, what that means to anyone who's not familiar with the Android ecosystem is anything that is like Google branded stuff. Um, so open source is Android. Android itself is open source. But the apps that make it make it Google, like the Google Play Store, the like Google Maps, all of Google's proprietary stuff that runs on Android to make it a Google Android device, uh, they're not going to be allowed to use them. Now there's ways around that, but you have to root your phone or whatever, and you have to trick it into playing these, you're running these things. So all the things that make all the things that give you the Android ecosystem on top of Android are all Google's. So if Google says you can't run them, then you have an Android device that you, you're basically, you don't have a, an app store, you don't have, you know, all the, the Google add-ons. Um, so that is kind of devastating for uh, a vendor who was previously in Google's good graces. So, yeah. And, and, and I mean, this is, we've been talking about Huawei and uh, uh, Hikvision, um, but I mean, the, the larger, sort of larger focus here is that this this I don't know if it's officially being called a trade war or not but I mean that the talk is that there's a 20% tariff on goods from China now um everything is going to go up in price I mean 
think about what you have in, you know, that you get day to day. I mean, a lot of this stuff comes from China. I know um, at least a couple, you know, a couple of Kickstarters that I saw um, have canceled. Like they, they outright said like, look, you know, with the, with the tariff changes and the trade war, like we can't, right. We can't do this for the price that we were, we were, yeah. we were looking at. Yes. Yeah, I mean, it, uh, it sucks, but like, a lot of people depend on inexpensive electronics out of China, whether you like it right. or not. I mean, everybody wants to tout, oh, American made and all. Well, American made comes with a price. It might be quality. Yeah. It might be local. It might be giving Americans jobs, but Americans are expensive. And, and you know, even even the expensive stuff, a lot of that comes out of China, too. Yeah. Um, I mean, Oh, yeah, absolutely. You look at, absolutely. You look, you look at stuff from like, I but think Samsung comes out of China. If you, if you take comes out of China. If you take the expensive Chinese stuff. And I don't mean Chinese stuff in a negative connotation. I mean, if you if you take the stuff that's made in China, like the iPhone, for example, that's made in China, right? Yeah. Expensive. Yeah. iPhone's an expensive device. Yep. If you were to take that and manufacture it in the U.S., it would probably be twice or three times or even more expensive than it is now, even right. with the Apple markup. Right. Yeah. I mean, look, Americans, Americans want to get paid more, um, you know. I don't want to turn this into a big political thing. I could say all sorts of stuff, but yeah, no, I mean, it's it, really it's, just, it's, it's, it's not a political thing. It's a culture thing. The Chinese people just, their culture allows them to be paid like they are. It's simple as that. So. I don't know if it's, the, uh, I don't know. I, I, I don't know that I would agree. Well, it's the culture, it but, but it, if, <laughs> if they're willing to work for the, peanuts, I would, peanuts I would say, I would say the circumstances in China means that, a lot of the the people there get paid a lot less to do a lot more and it and yes it benefits americans a lot and and other countries right. i'm sure but yeah yeah uh, is i don't know that it's right in in a lot of cases i would say it's not right um but the so the different like if, if you if, if they got paid to, the same as americans wanted to get paid for that same job like the cost on everything is going to go up well, and, it, I, and I think at the end of the day, maybe it should. But when it when it's trying to come down to whether it's right or wrong, I, I think it depends on whether they're being paid enough to live for the work they're doing. Because the the I, I think one of the reasons that Americans get paid more is because they're not willing to do that amount of, that amount of work for for a smaller wage, and because of that, everything's more expensive here. Right when when when. When a population is paid better, everything's more expensive. When they're paid less, they can afford less. Therefore, everything's less expensive, right? Like at its core. No, <laughs> you're thinking hard. I, 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 yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm ill prepared for this debate. Yeah, no, and <laughs> I'm not claiming to be some some economist, but basically, if if someone offered me a third of my wage for doing the exact same thing that I do now. I would starve to death because in the U.S. I have to make what I make to live. To live the lifestyle that you have. To live yes. the lifestyle that I have. Right. right. I couldn't. I couldn't just be like, okay, yeah, totally. I'll work for a third of my pay. Uh, but then, like, I won't have a place to live, or I'll have to turn off all of my utilities, or I won't be able to buy food, right. or I have to start making some really hard choices. Where if I was making a third of my pay all along, and everyone around me makes a third of what they make now. Like everything has to be less expensive, otherwise everybody's starving. You know what I mean? Yeah, I, 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 I don't know enough about China. I don't think that's entirely the reality there. But yeah, like because a lot of these, a lot of these people, my understanding from what I've read and what I've been told is you have like say take Foxconn. Foxconn's always the interesting whipping boy. Um, yeah, and of course yeah. Foxconn only works on Apple. Um, although you know. Newsflash, uh, companies like Dell also have their stuff built there. Yeah. Um, the Fox people that the, a lot of buy to build your own machines with. Right. A lot of the um, the workers at Foxconn, the way that the, they've set things up is they move away from the towns that they or the, the, uh, the villages that they lived in. They move to where a Foxconn um, factory is and they they are they're work at Foxconn, part of their wage goes to pay for the bed that they have at the Foxconn oh. facility. And they live there. They live, they, they eat the, you know, they, they eat there, they, they work there and they take all the money that they make and send it back to their family in the village 
so that their family can live, but they're living arguably a not wonderful life. And and a lot of these yeah. work, you know, they work 12 hours a day, this seven days really, a week. Uh, this sounds really similar to like the old mining industry, local. Right. Yeah, exactly. Where you worked in the mine and you lived at a house that was owned by the mine and you shopped at the store that was owned by the mine. And right. it, was all, I mean, it was all on company credit. And by the end of the week, all the salary you made was actually not enough to cover all the money you spent. So you were just in debt further every week. Right. Uh, I don't know if it's quite right. that bad in China, but no, I don't. Similar. I don't, <laughs> I don't think it's quite that bad. Yeah. I mean, from what, again, from what I've read and heard. Um, but it's not it's not ideal. And I mean, China doesn't have the greatest track record in the world of human rights either. So, like, you know, there's a lot that needs to be fixed. Um, you know, in the U.S., like we're incredibly privileged for what we yeah, do. I, mean, I, I want to be clear. I wasn't trying to say everything's sunshine and roses in China. I'm just saying, yeah, yeah. you know. Yeah, and I mean you're right. Like, everyone's making if, less. Things must be less if, expensive. Otherwise, if that's the basic, starving to death. Right. If that's basically what happens across the majority of the population, or at least a large majority of the population, then it's considered you know normal um, by their standards. And right. You're right. Like the the costs of things are a little bit lower, but I don't think you know they're not getting the same quality stuff either. Like you know. They may be getting lower quality products. You know, again, I don't, I don't live in China, so I'm not 100 percent sure. But yeah, maybe um, we should stop making judgments about China. We should, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not trying to make a judgment. Of, yeah, I mean, <laughs> I don't, I don't necessarily want to make a judgment, but I think, I think, you know, like where the this whole tariff thing with China, um, honestly, I don't think has anything to do with the average Chinese citizen. This is a government versus government thing. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and I think I don't think it. Be, I think it benefits the government, and I don't think it benefits the citizen, on either side. Um, you know, I think I think both sides are going to suffer because you think if we get a twenty, if there's a twenty percent tariff, our prices go up. We buy less stuff. We buy less stuff. China makes less stuff. China makes less stuff. They have less yeah. jobs. More people don't have jobs, right? So, like, it's going to hurt the, both sides. And all the tariff is doing is going into the government's pocket, right? That's what a tariff is. It's like a tariff. I believe so. Yes. So, so it's it's, so, it's yeah, the government I, saying it costs you X to import into this country. Where does that right. money go? I don't know. I I always assumed it went back to the government. Yeah, and and it, you know, at the end of the day, like the cost of things is going to go up, and it, and yeah. it's starting to hurt already, and I think it's just going to get worse. Um, you know, we'll see. Maybe there's some grand strategy and things are going to be wonderful, but you know, I, I don't, I don't hold much hope for that. So, um, I, I've also ran out of news. Um, yeah, we're finally out of news. I can go find some more if you want. I, I do want to mention. I, I didn't bring it up in the chat. Yes, I went to Summit. <laughs> I took a bunch of notes during a bunch of talks and a bunch of keynotes, and I have not had a chance to actually like correlate all that into content. It'll probably end up as articles on my blog and maybe content for Iron System. I, I don't know what I'm going to do with it yet, but I, I did take a bunch of notes. A lot of really cool stuff happened at Summit. Um, Rel 8's out. So your 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 next project is to run a Rel 8 server with Podman deploying all the containers that sure. make OpenStack work with OpenShift? <laughs> yeah, there you go. Kubernetes. You've got enough of the buzzwords in there. Yeah. Uh, but no, I, I did see some interesting talks. The keynotes were pretty cool. Um, uh, I keep forgetting I keep forgetting how to pronounce his name, but the the head of Microsoft, Sa Satya, is it Satya? Oh, Satya. Satya? Satya Nadella. Uh, he was on stage with Jim Whitehurst, which is pretty cool. Um, God, I'm still kicking myself. I missed a chance to hang out at the summit party and chat with Jim Whitehurst. Like well, literally I face mean, to face. <laughs> maybe you no one yourself to blame. No one, maybe no one cares about that. But basically, at the end of summit, like a lot of conferences this size, there was like there's a party, right? They had a couple bands and there were drinks and free food and stuff. And at the end of the day, I was just like tired. And every summit party I'd been to in the past had been like okay, but not awesome. So I'm like, I'm just gonna go back to the hotel. I'm gonna hang out. I'm gonna fill my laptop a little bit. I'm gonna get some rest because I got a long drive tomorrow. So I went back. Well. Being part of the Red Hat Accelerators, we had like special access to like a private tent at, I think there was a private tent or anyway, I think that's where these guys were at. The rest of the accelerators went to the, the party and freaking 
on we have a Slack channel that we all chat on. In the Slack channel, start showing up pictures of all the people I've been hanging out with at Summit and Jim Whitehurst. Like, <laughs> yeah, you missed out on uh, the inside line on what's going on at Red Hat and how to get great cheap tickets from Delta. Oh, he right. Was C- he, he was the CEO of Delta. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> So at any rate, uh, yeah, I missed that on that. That would have been cool. Maybe I could have talked him into being a, a guest on our show. <laughs> hey, you got that super secret access. You could still do it. Yeah, right, right. So that was that was fun. But yeah, some cool talks. There's some cool stuff coming out with OpenShift version four. That's really starting to mature as a as a platform. Um, yeah. I talked to a number of people about OpenStack and about uh, running it and what sort of. Um, manpower it takes and everyone pretty much agreed that a small team can't run OpenStack. So I think my dreams of one day running OpenStack are destroyed. Maybe. That's, that's a shame. Automation. It's all you need all you need is automation. You yeah, well it. I mean that's that's with automation, man. It's like it's deployed with Ansible and whatever, but they said like the care and feeding for OpenStack is just astronomical. Well, then this came from better. like this came from like Red Hat's IT. I saw a talk where Red Hat's IT was moving from from a traditional infrastructure to OpenStack with OpenShift on top of it. And so, of course, like that's a thing I've wanted to do for a long time. So I went to the talk and I talked to them afterward. And he's like, yeah, don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> like, unless you have a bigger team, don't do that. <laughs> I, I have faith in you. You can do this. No, I, I feel like I probably could, but I may end up just like killing myself with the amount of work that it is. And if I ever were to move on to a different position or like get hit by a bus or whatever, my employer would be totally just like at a loss for how to run this thing. So got to be realistic, I guess. Sounds like a cool project, but unless I'm uh, working for a, for a bigger team, it's not going to, not going to pan out. All right. Anyway, that's not news, but it was chat and I should have talked about it in the chat. So yeah, hopefully content from summit will be coming. All right, I think uh, I think we've we've uh, we may have gone over time. Yeah, maybe we're at two hours. Yeah, yeah. So time we've done that. Maybe it's time to kill it for the night. Yeah, I think I think we're done for tonight. So, folks, thank you for tuning in. If you tuned in live, uh, if you're listening to this after the fact, thank you for listening. Um, it's been a while since we've done one of these. I'm I'm like I'm out of the flow of how to do the the outro. Yeah, I mean, if you have uh, if you have suggestions, thoughts, uh, comments, whatever, uh, you can write to us at this email address that uh, uh, Nate will tell you right now. Um, what is it again? Podcast at ironsystem dot com, I think. <laughs> um, uh, if you have uh, suggestions on, yeah, if you have suggestions on guests, uh, or or you want to be a guest, um, I mean, reach out. Uh, we're happy to chat. Um, yeah, absolutely. You can uh, also hit us up on Twitter at Iron Sysadmin. You might know that already. Um, YouTube.com slash Iron Sysadmin podcast. If we can get the Google Hangout, Hangouts on air to work next time. <laughs> yeah, apologies for it not working. I, uh, yeah, I think I think a lot of people are going to miss the live show tonight because, you know, assuming that they've subscribed to the channel, they wouldn't have gotten the notification because we couldn't go live on the normal channel. So, right. That's a shame. Meanwhile, the people that are on your other channel are very confused. Yeah, well, no, I don't produce anything on that. It's just me. So, Uh. yeah, right. Anyway, um, we got a Slack. You can join it if you want to. IronSysadmin.com slash Slack. We're on the socials. I already mentioned Twitter. We're also IronSysadmin on Facebook. And you can subscribe to the show wherever you find your podcasts. And I think that is a wrap. We have a Patreon. Oh, yes, Patreon. How did I miss that? That's the one where we might get money. You can find us on Patreon. You can support the show that way. Iron Sysadmin. Yeah, ironsysadmin.com. No, patreon.com slash ironsysadmin. Guys, it's getting late. It's been a long week. Well, all you need to do now is add a, uh, a redirect from ironsysadmin.com slash Patreon. To I do. The same thing. And it works both ways. I don't know why I didn't do that. I, I just gave you the idea. Yeah, now you... Brilliant idea. Brilliant. I'm sure that's going to up our Patreon from the $18 a month that we get to like, I don't know, 19, 18, 18 and 19, a half, 19. 18 right. and a half dollars. All right. <laughs> All right, folks. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Gangriff. Jason, you want to share your handle? I am YouTube? at Xenophage. And I think we're going to call it a night. Good night, everybody. Night all. <laughs>